Listening test one. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer the questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer all your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. Listen to the conversation between John, who is an accommodation officer for overseas students, and Susan, a Canadian student who wants an apartment, and complete the form. Look at questions one to five on the form now. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first and repeated. Hi, Students Housing Office. I'm John. Can I help you? Hi. I hope so. I need an apartment. The sooner, the better. My friends suggested I try you guys. Well, that's what we're here for—the famous students housing office. By the way, we call apartments flats here. Anyway, let's get started. First, I'll take down a few particulars to put in our database. Hopefully, we'll help you find some digs before term starts. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. First. You have another chance to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, Students Housing Office. I'm John. Can I help you? Hi. I hope so. I need an apartment. The sooner, the better. My friends suggested I try you guys. Well, that's what we're here for—the famous Students Housing Office. By the way, we call apartments flats here. Anyway, let's get started. First, I'll take down a few particulars to put in our database. Hopefully, we'll help you find some digs before term starts. Some what? Some digs. That's British slang for rented accommodation. Oh dear, flats, digs, and I'm an English major. No problem. But back to business. Okay, family name. Cartier. Cartier, sounds French. Yeah, my ancestors were French. Wow, do you speak French? I was born and raised in Montreal, so I'm bilingual. That's great. And your given names? Susan Marie. That's M A R I E. Got it. Nationality? Canadian, I guess. Right. And your student number? C A O four six two eight. Okay. Got a contact number? It's six five three four nine zero eight seven. I'm staying with friends until I find a place of my own. Six five three four nine one eight seven. No, nine zero eight seven. Got it. What about a mobile phone? I'll get one later today and tell you the number. Okay, six five three. That's way over the other side of town, right? Yes, near the railway station. Far too far if I have classes every day. So you want somewhere closer? Up to half an hour by bike, and with a bus service if the weather is too bad. Yeah, I cycle here too. Keeps me fit and no hassle trying to find a parking space. Do you want to share accommodation or live on your own? Live alone. I'll be too busy with my studies to bother with roommates. How much rent do you want to pay? Around five hundred pounds a month. Look at questions six to ten.
Now listen to more of the conversation between John and Susan and answer questions six to ten. That's about right, but it won't be very big. Would a bed sitter be okay? A bed sitter? More British English for you. It's a single room with cooking facilities. Some are quite nice. That'll be okay, but I don't want to share a bathroom, and it must be clean, bright, and not by a noisy main road. Okay, but you've come a bit late. With only four days to go before the term starts, we've only got shared accommodation on our files at the moment. But don't worry, we'll do our best. Oh, I forgot. Does the rent here include utilities? Usually, no. You have to pay the gas, electricity, and water yourself. What about a deposit? Most landlords want three months in advance, which is also a security deposit. And make sure you read the rental contract carefully, especially the small print. Thanks. I'll do that. Anything else you need to know? Not at the moment. Make sure you let me know your mobile phone number. Will do. Anyway, I must go now. I'm meeting some friends in the cafeteria. Okay, we'll be in touch. Bye for now. See you. That is the end of section one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two, you are going to hear an introduction to a library by George Martin, who is the head librarian. First, look at questions eleven to sixteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to sixteen. Good morning, and welcome to the main library of the University of British Columbia. My name is George Martin, and I'm the head librarian. And happy to give you a brief introduction to our library. I guess I'm qualified. I've been working here since 1961, back in the days when the only electrical or electronic stuff here was the lights. Oh, and the phones, of course. Mechanical typewriters and slide rules. Then, no fancy laptops and cell phones. Computers? In a library? No way. Everything was on paper. If you needed to find something, you went to the card index. And if that didn't help, you asked one of the staff. And if that didn't work, you told your professor that you couldn't write the essay because the library didn't have the book you needed. My, you students have it so easy nowadays. We've got about fifteen computer terminals on each of our four floors. If you know the title or the author, then you can find out if we've got it in seconds, and if we do, where it is. If we haven't got it, then you can find out if the public libraries and other university libraries in Vancouver and Barnaby have it. Now you know that library books are arranged according to the numbers on the back of each book. Does anyone know the name of this numbering system? Right, the Dewey Decimal Classification System, which was invented by Melville Dewey, an American librarian, not John Dewey the philosopher. Now look at questions seventeen to twenty. As the talk continues, answer questions seventeen to twenty. In Melville's day, book classification systems were in a real mess, so he decided to do something about it, and around eighteen seventy-six came up with the system we still use today. Look up there, and you can see a list of basic categories: zero, 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 generalities, 
which includes all sorts of things, encyclopedias, news media, etc., etc. Then a hundred, philosophy and psychology. Two hundred, religion. Three hundred, social sciences, and so on up to nine hundred, geography and history. With over four million books, actually nearer to five million now in our library, we have a lot to thank Melville for. Now, if you look up to your right, you can see the layout of the library. It's very logical. We start down here on the first floor, or the ground floor for our British cousins, with three zeros, generalities, and so on up to the fourth floor with all the eight hundreds and nine hundreds. By the way. You won't find books on medicine and dentistry here; they're all over in the me medical library, just to the east of the medical school. Now, if you look at the plan of the second floor, you can see we have a CD and DVD library. The music collection covers just about everything that we call serious, from Bach and Beethoven, folk music, blues, early rock and roll, jazz, and more. But sorry, no punk, heavy metal, rap, or hip hop yet. For Oriental music like Peking Opera, you'll have to go to the Asian Studies Centre or Chinatown. A word about taking books out: the usual lending period is two weeks, but a few books in great demand can only be taken out for two days. And I suggest you try to return books on time. The fine is a dollar a day for the first week and a dollar a day thereafter. That's a lot of beer money. One last thing. Your fancy new smart student card is also your library card, and you can also use it to pay at the student cafeteria. So don't lose it, or you'll starve to death without any library books. Okay, I guess that's enough here. Let's move up to the second floor. That is the end of section two. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You are going to hear a conversation between Jack and Mary, who are two college students. They are talking about the courses they should take. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. You now have some time to read questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Hi, Mary. Got time for a coffee? I'd love to discuss what courses I should take. I'm so confused. So am I. But maybe we can work something out together, Jack. We should really talk about this with our academic supervisor. But she's away until Thursday, which might make it a bit late to register for some of the more popular courses. That's my worry. It's lucky we're doing the same major, so some of the courses will be the same, and we can cycle in together. What did your parents say when you told them? You would be an English major. Well, Dad thinks I'm crazy. You'll never find a decent job when you graduate. Teacher or secretary—that's about all you'll be good for. But he's an engineer, so what would he know? What about your mum? Oh, she loves reading and has dreams of me becoming a great writer or something. So she's all for it. What about your parents? Actually, they agree. They're both teachers and are always moaning about the terrible English of most of their students. They blame it on computers, computer games, to be exact. Very few of their students ever read novels. Anyway, let's have a look at some of these courses. I thought of taking Latin. People say it'll train my brain and help with French and Spanish as well as English. I think that's nonsense. It's a dead language. If you want to learn Spanish or Italian or something, then learn it directly. I did Latin at high school, and apart from helping me guess the meaning of some of new words with a Latin root. It was a waste of time. 
Leave Latin to archaeologists and theologians. Guess you're right. Okay, no Latin. Actually, I'm playing with the idea of doing journalism later. Foreign languages are always useful for a journalist. Maybe I'll take oral French. As the conversation continues, answer questions 27 to 30. You now have some time to read questions 27 to 30. That's exactly what I was thinking. What are the lecture times? Let me see. French 100, 9 to 12 Monday mornings in language lab number 2, and 2 till 5 Thursday afternoons in lecture hall A5. I think they're both in the arts faculty building. They are. I checked the language lab out yesterday. Very modern and not too big. Room for about 30, so the teacher will have more time for individuals. Not like that 50-seat place in my old school. Okay, French 100 it is. What next? I was thinking about Creative Writing 201. What do you think? That's one of our set courses, stupid. We have to take it along with History of English, Early American Literature, and Sociology 100. Damn, I forgot. So including French, we'll be doing five courses this term. How many classroom hours is that all together? Let's see. History of English, three hours every Tuesday morning. American Lit... 2 till 5 Tuesday afternoons, creative writing, 9 till 12 Wednesday mornings, sociology, 2 till 5 Friday afternoons. That makes 18, including 3 hours in the language lab. Sounds enough to me, especially in our first term. And the times won't interfere with my swimming team training. All work, no play makes Jack a dull boy. You certainly need that creative writing course. Let's drink our coffee. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. You are going to hear a lecture about environment and development by Professor John Robertson. You now have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all looking so refreshed after spending the weekend testing the beer in the students' bar. I wonder if any of you discovered the library, but I guess it's far too early for that. It's even better to see we have a full house. I hope you are all here for Environment and Development 101, because if you are not, then you are in the wrong lecture hall. By the way, my name is John Robertson, and I'll be the main lecturer for this course, but we will have some guest lecturers from time to time. And nobody has left. Great. I guess that means you all intend to take this course. Okay. As it says on the notice outside, today I'm going to describe the main contents and purposes of the course and, hopefully, add to the enthusiasm that brought you here today. Does anybody know who Howard Odom was? Right? He is known as the father of ecology. He once said, Everything is connected to everything else. And that statement explains the design of this course. 
As human knowledge expands, most courses, even first-year courses, get more and more specialized. You learn more and more about less and less. This course is quite different. In the 72 hours of this course, don't forget you get two credits for it instead of the usual one. We will try to achieve three main objectives. Namely, we will try to get an understanding of what is happening to planet Earth, why it is happening, and hopefully to find some answers to the many problems that we'll be talking about. The first few lectures will be an overview of the more serious current trends that are of such great concern to, not just greenies, meaning environmentalists like myself, and organizations like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, but also to more and more ordinary people and even a few politicians and corporate leaders. So we'll be looking at things like global warming, the loss of, in particular, tropical forests, persistent organic chemicals, known as gender benders, because they can seriously affect the sexual development of animals, desertification, the serious worldwide problem of overfishing, and the accelerating loss of biodiversity. If humans carry on as they are, some 50% of the world's plant and animal species will be probably extinct by the middle of this century. That's the environment bit. What about development? We'll be thinking a lot about this issue. If the goal of development is to improve the quality of life, which presumably means making people happier, then we have to think about this thing called happiness. In modern times, we have become consumers in the great consumer society. Are we any happier than the bushmen of the Kalahari Desert in southern Africa? And if common sense tells us that rising sea levels, gender benders, and all the other aspects of a worsening environment will sooner or later put a big break on consumption. Why? Given the warnings from the great majority of the world's scientists, are things in general continuing to get worse? This brings us on to psychology, sociology, and, of course, politics, economics, and even philosophy. We won't have time to go into each of these areas in great depth. For our immediate purposes, this is not necessary, because the basic goal is to help us develop a model, a dynamic model, that integrates the main forces leading to environmental degradation and those opposing forces that promote environmental stewardship. This is a tall order for us to do as individuals, so we'll be dividing into teams, and each team will focus on one or two particular aspects, at the same time integrating the main findings and arguments of the other teams into their work. Well, we have a lot of great work to do, which means it's coffee time. Back in 15 minutes. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have ten minutes to transfer all your answers to the answer sheet. Listening Test 2. You'll hear a number of different recordings and you'll have to answer the questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you'll have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. 
Write all your answers in the question booklet. At the end of the test, you'll be given 10 minutes to transfer all your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. Listen to the conversation between Fred and Mary, who are talking about a, about a farewell party, and answer questions 1 to 4. Now look at questions 1 to 4. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first and repeated. Mary, thank God you're here. We've a ton of work to do if we're going to get everything ready for tonight. Whose idea was it to have this going away party for Christ anyway? It was your idea, Fred. Remember? Hey, I suggested a small get-together for a few close friends. I didn't mean inviting half the university. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have another chance to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Mary, thank God you're here. We've a ton of work to do if we're going to get everything ready for tonight. Whose idea was it to have this going away party for Christ anyway? It was your idea, Fred. Remember? Hey, I suggested a small get-together for a few close friends. I didn't mean inviting half the university. Well, it's too late now. We have about three hours to get everything under control. Have you got that list of things we need to do? Yeah, it's in my room. Hang on, I'll go get it. Hell, I can't find it. What do you mean you can't find it? I can't find it. What do you think I mean? Damn, I remember I left it in the library. OK, OK, cool down. We'll manage. I can remember what's on it. Let's check the food and drink situation. Did you arrange the beer? Yeah, Jim said he'd bring ten cases of cold Budweiser, ice and a couple of big bins to keep it cold. Says he'll get here around five. Huh, you know Jim. He'll probably turn up drunk around midnight. No problem. I phoned him a few minutes ago. He's at Jenny's place. She's keeping him away from alcohol until he's delivered everything safe and sound. What about the wine? You said you'd look after it. Oh, my God, I completely forgot. What's the time? Half past three. OK, I'll go to the liquor store and sort it out. Will they deliver? No problem. But you'll have to pay up front. I reckon about 60 people will turn up. Allow for half a bottle per person. That makes 30 bottles, half red, half white. What do you think? That should be enough. Better to have too much than too little. Why not make it 40? 25 red and 15 white. As the conversation continues, answer questions 5 to 10. Yeah, I guess most people prefer red. Where's the nearest liquor store? Not far. Go out the front door, turn right. Sorry, left. Take the second street on your right and it's 300 yards down on the left, just before you get to the park. OK, I'll go in a few minutes. Let's first make a quick list to make sure we haven't forgotten anything. Glasses, glasses, what about glasses? Sally borrowed a hundred beer glasses and a hundred wine glasses from the student bar. They're in the cupboard. Should be enough. Yeah, should be. And what about the barbecue? I've got two barbecues and plenty of charcoal out the back. And Jane and I spent three hours yesterday getting the steaks, chicken legs and sausages ready. They're all in the big fridge. Should taste terrific. Tons of garlic, pepper and soy sauce. No MSG. Sounds good. What about plates and things? Sally has looked after that as well. She's borrowed them from the bar too. They're in the cupboard with the glasses. 
You know, Sally refuses to use throwaway things. Bad for the environment. Good for her. Oh, just remembered. Could you pick up another twenty loaves of French bread and a few packets of paper napkins? No problem. Is there a shop on the way? There's a supermarket just before you get to the liquor store. Can you manage everything, or should I go with you? I'll manage. I've got this huge rucksack. No problem. Damn! Just remembered. I'm over my limit on my credit card. Have you got five hundred dollars on you? We'll work out who owes who. How much later? No problem. I took out a thousand dollars this morning. Here's five hundred. Ta. Okay, I'll get going. I'll see you in a while. Ciao. See you. That is the end of section one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You are going to hear a talk by Richard Thomas, who is the head of the chemistry department of a college. He is going to give a brief introduction of the college, and you must answer questions according to what you hear. Now, first look at questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Royal Hospital College. What a beautiful September day you've brought with you! My name is Richard Thomas. I'm the head of the chemistry department, and today it's my pleasure to introduce our wonderful college to you. Normally, the dean, Professor John Thomas, yes, we share the same surname, likes to do this, but unfortunately, he has a bad case of flu. So he is doing the sensible thing and staying in bed. He sends his apologies, but you'll be meeting him soon, so no big problem. I'm sure you are all so excited at the thought of studying here that you have read all about the history of our school. But for those who haven't, I'll give you a brief summary as we walk around. The college was originally founded in anybody know? Yes, 1694. By William and Mary of Orange, can you remember your high school history? Right, William of Orange was a Dutch prince married to King James the Second's eldest daughter, Mary. Sixteen ninety four, poor Queen Mary died of smallpox the same year. Actually, the school was not a school in those days; it was a hospital for retired sailors of the Royal Navy. And it wasn't here in the beautiful countryside of East England. It was located in what is now East London on the banks of the River Thames. Back in those days, it was also in the countryside. But London grew and grew, and by the end of the nineteenth century, it was surrounded by houses and smoky factories. So, after the Second World War, a New Zealand millionaire named Sir Gifford Reid. Kindly gave the school sixty-five million pounds to move to here. He was an architect, and he designed much of the beautiful school that you see today. It opened in nineteen sixty-three, and if you look to your right, there is a statue of Sir Gifford Reid facing that other large statue of Queen Victoria. As the talk is going on, answer the questions sixteen to twenty. Okay, let's jump back to the 1700s. In the 1780s, the Royal Hospital was changed into a school for the orphans of officers and men of the Royal Navy, and they added the word college to the name. 
For nearly a hundred years, it was coeducational. But in 1868, the Board of Governors decided to make it boys only. Much more boring, don't you think? And it stayed that way right up until 1991, when the school became coeducational again. Okay, and here we are at the school church. Do we have any musicians with us? You? Wonderful. What do you play? Piano and organ. Oh, you'll love it here. Our church has the largest organ in England, and we often have recording companies, the BBC, etc., coming here to record. And our staff and students are more than welcome to play it. In fact, there's a waiting list. It's very popular. In fact, the school is very well known for its choir and orchestra. I sing in the choir, and last summer we toured North America. Great fun. A healthy mind in a healthy body, as the Romans used to say. Which brings us to our gym and swimming pool. Both are open from six in the morning till eleven at night, seven days a week. The gym has everything you need for aerobics, weight training, martial arts, basketball, gymnastics, and even an indoor running track. So there's no excuse for not keeping fit. And of course, we have all the usual team sports, soccer, basketball. Our women's basketball team won the All England Universities Championship this year. Rugby, water polo, no American football. So you see, we are quite a sporty lot here. And we also study sometimes. Here's the main library. I'm afraid we can't go in because it's being redecorated. It's supposed to open again this Wednesday, but it looks to me that it'll be a bit late. And here's the coffee shop. Why don't we stop here for a drink? Agree? Jolly good. That is the end of section two. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You're going to hear a conversation between John and Anne, two students who are talking about their survey. Answer questions 21 to 26 first. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 26. Hi, Anne. How's it going? Thank goodness I've finished that survey on television watching and reading ability. What was your survey on? I told you before. I wanted to find out if there is any relationship between how fat students are and how many times they eat at fast food restaurants. That's right. I'd forgotten. Have you got your report finished, all the graphs and charts, that sort of thing? Almost done. What about you? all ready to present to the class, apart from one or two small things. Actually, my results are really interesting. Want me to tell you what I found? Sure, if you promise to let me tell you what I found. No problem. Anyway, look at this graph here. On the x-axis, I have the dependent variable reading level. How did you measure reading level? I used the English department test, and on the y-axis, I have a number of hours usually spent watching television every week. 13 to 19, 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, and 50 to 59. What are these numbers? The people's ages. I managed to get exactly 20 people from each age group to do the test. Took me ages. And what did you find out? Well, look at this. If we take the 100 people as one group, we see that the more television people watch, the worse their reading level. That's not surprising. But did you find any significant difference between the different age groups? You bet. 
Okay. This is the curve for the group as a whole. These lines are for the different age groups. See what I see? Wow, that's fascinating. The two youngest groups are very similar. Big difference between the oldest two groups and the youngest two. The older the people are, the less the correlation between reading level and hours spent in front of the TV. Why do you think that is? Well, I need to do more research before I can say for sure. But from talking to the people, it's clear that over the past 30 years, most people have been watching more television and reading fewer books. But the older people... Don't tell me. They spent more time reading when they were young than young people nowadays. So they learned to read well, and even though they spend more time in front of the TV than they used to, their reading levels stay the same. Hey, you're pretty smart. That's exactly what I think. But I need to do more research before I can say for sure. How about your survey? As the conversation continues, answer questions 27 to 30. Nothing surprising. Well, actually, one thing is really interesting. Look, this is the number of times people usually go to a fast food place every week. And these are the percentages of people who are normal weight, overweight or obese, meaning really, really fat. Look, no fast food, only about 5% are obese. And look, 12 or more, about a third. And another graph, we have the number of hours they exercise every week. Wow, a big difference. More junk food, less exercise, more fat. I didn't think it would be so obvious. That's great work. Why do you think people who exercise more tend to eat less junk food? I asked everyone about that and found that people who care about their health do more exercise and eat fewer french fries and all that other greasy food, fast food stuff. Simple. That makes sense. But I see you found lots of people who eat the stuff more than once a day on average. I can't believe it. You'd be surprised. You're right. Hey, who's this guy? More than 12 a week? I bet it was Richard. He must weigh 260 kilos. And he's pretty short. All fat, no muscle. You're right. And he drinks tons of soft drinks. All that sugar. Okay, that's it. Healthy food only from now on. And get to the gym, fatty. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You're going to hear a lecture on corporate crime. You now have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Good evening. Welcome once again to Criminology 201. I'm happy to see you all looking so alert and full of energy after a busy day. Tonight, and for the next few weeks, we will be looking at what is clearly a very important topic, corporate crime. First of all, what do we mean by corporate crime? The simple answer, of course, is crime committed by a corporation usually by the heads of a corporation working together. But what about a crime committed by, for example, the CEO of a company, who without the knowledge of his colleagues, bribes a government official in order to get a big fat contract for his company? 
Well, we won't be looking at this kind of white-collar crime. Rather, we'll restrict our study to cases where the top people in a business entity work together and knowingly break the law, and especially those cases where, until they get caught, this type of unlawful behaviour is actually part of the corporate culture. First, why do they do it? The simple answer is to make more money. Well, most businessmen want to make more money, but they don't break the law to do so. So what factors make a group of men, yes, they are usually men, but women are by no means immune from this temptation, decide to step outside the law? In the next few weeks, we'll be looking into this question with a lot of case studies in some depth. We will also try to divide corporate crime into several categories and see what they share in common in terms of the psychology and organisational culture of those who commit them. And we will also look into the legal, social and political settings in which these crimes occur. A particularly interesting aspect of corporate crime is the process of detection, trial and punishment. It often seems that this type of crime goes on for an unreasonable length of time before it is detected by the authorities. Is this true, and if so, why? There is also a common perception that people found guilty of corporate crimes are treated much more leniently by the courts than, for example, your common everyday thief, or murderer even. Is this true, and if so, why? I mentioned that we will divide corporate crime into several categories and look at some specific cases. What categories can we think of? Well, one is that of product safety, where a company markets a product that it knows to be unsafe. One of the landmark cases in corporate criminology of this type is the Ford Pinto case. Ford was accused of rushing the production of an unsafe car, and in 1980 there was the criminal trial of the Ford Motor Company for reckless homicide. We'll look at the research on white-collar crime and studies on organisational culture and structure to examine the lack of safety and recall regulations that may have contributed to as many as 500 deaths. As one report put it, much of the literature on the Ford Pinto case focuses on how consumer safety was willingly sacrificed in the face of corporate greed. Another category of corporate crime is manipulation of a company's share prices. One form of this is insider trading. Closely related and sometimes very difficult to prove is a kind of creative accounting whereby, for example, profits are exaggerated in order to drive up a company's share prices. Take the Enron scandal. On November 29, 2001, the Wall Street Journal ran an article in which they reported that for years the company may have been President Bush's biggest financial backers donating nearly $2 million to his campaigns. And it appeared that the Bush administration's national energy plan might have been in part an effort to help one of Bush's largest contributors. So we see politics creeping into this corporate crime question. That is the end of Section 4. You now have some time to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer all your answers to the answer sheet. Listening Test 3. You'll hear a number of different recordings and you'll have to answer the questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you'll have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. 
The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the question booklet. At the end of the test, you'll be given 10 minutes to transfer all your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. Listen to the conversation between a doctor's secretary and Mr. Jones, who wants, who wants to make an appointment with the doctor. Now look at questions 1 to 5 on the form. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first and repeated. Good morning, Dr. Ritter's office. Can I help you? Hi. Yes, I'd like to make an appointment to come in for a checkup, please. OK. May I have your name, please? Yes, it's Jones. Peter Jones. And you want a medical examination? That's right. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have another chance to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Dr. Ritter's office. Can I help you? Hi. Yes, I'd like to make an appointment to come in for a checkup, please. OK. May I have your name, please? Yes, it's Jones, Peter Jones. And you want a medical examination? That's right. By the way, my name's Rebecca. I'm Dr. Ritter's secretary. Have you seen Dr. Ritter before, Mr. Jones? Actually, no, Rebecca. We've only just moved to Los Angeles two days ago. Great. Welcome to LA, Mr. Jones. Thank you. When would you like to come in? Any time this week would be fine. I don't have to go into office until next Monday. OK, let me see. But first, to see how long you'll need, could you tell me why you need the medical? My insurance company needs it, and my companies were in real estate. Medical insurance also wants me to have one. Kind of killing two birds with one stone. Sure is. Insurance companies want a fairly complete examination, so that means you'll have to come in the morning and don't eat or drink anything after midnight the night before. No problem. Let me see. Would 9am Thursday be convenient? 9am Thursday. No problem. Oh, I forgot. We have a meeting with my children's new headmaster that morning. That's at 11. Look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen to more of the conversation between the secretary and Mr. Jones. Then answer questions 6 to 10. What school is that? Beverly Hills High School. Oh, that's no problem. The whole examination will take about an hour, maybe a bit more, and the school is only two blocks from here, a three-minute walk, so you'll have plenty of time. That's good. So 9am, Thursday. You got it. Now, to save time when you get here, I'll ask you a few questions. Fire away. First, what is your personal medical insurance company, Mr. Jones? Blue Cross. Blue Cross. And how old are you? 46 today. Happy birthday. Having a big party? Not really. We don't know anybody here yet, except for two neighbours. I think my family planned to take me out to dinner. A secret surprise, hey? OK, back to Blue Cross. I'm just checking what they need. Let's see. Blood pressure, standard blood and urine tests, cholesterol levels, ECG, checking for diabetes, heart disease, the usual things. Do you have a medical condition at the moment, Mr Jones? None at all, touch wood. Fit as a fiddle. That's great. I'm sure you'll stay that way. And do you know the name of your company's health plan? Yes, I've got it here somewhere. Here it is, the Kaiser Health Insurance Company. Kaiser, yes. They need the same information as Blue Cross, so, as you said, killing two birds with one stone. That's right. And can I have your telephone number, Mr Jones? Sure. My cell phone is 13805-56721. 13805-56721. Right. And my home number is area code 
5230296. And do you have email? Yes, the address is pjones12 at hotspot.com. pjones12 at hotspot.com. That's it. Well, that's all I need for now. See you Thursday, Mr. Jones. Sure thing, Rebecca. See you then. Bye. Bye. That is the end of section one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You are going to hear an introduction to a group tour to Australia by a travel company manager. First, look at questions eleven to fifteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Morning Sun Travel. I'm Rick Smith, and I manage our group tours to Australia, New Zealand, and the South Sea Islands. It's good to see so many of you here. As you know, I'm going to introduce our latest product, the Twenty One Day Grand Australian Tour. First of all, why did we develop this new tour? Well, our two-week Aussie tours have proved really popular over the past few years. So, after doing some market research, we found that there's a demand for a longer tour. In fact, looking around, I see some faces I recognise. You two went on our Australian tour last year, right? Great. Good to see you back again. If you think I'm exaggerating about Australia, you can interrupt me. Another thing. It's a long way from England to Australia, and many of our clients think it's a pity to go all that way for just a couple of weeks. So, our first three-week tour will head off in early November, about three months from now. Now, if we dim the light a bit, I'll show you some slides of what we'll do and see down under. Our first stop will be Sydney. It's one of my favourite cities. And we'll arrive mid-morning and check into one of my favourite hotels, the Five Seasons Hotel, Sydney. America's most popular travel magazine selected it as the best hotel in Australia. Believe me, it deserves every one of its five stars. It has fantastic views of Sydney Harbour, the famous Opera House, and Sydney Harbour Bridge. And for those of you who were born to shop, it's just a short walk away from Sydney's major shopping and business districts. Great restaurants and bars, and for those of us who like to keep fit, there's a state-of-the-art spa and fitness centre with sauna and heated outdoor pool. We'll have lunch in the hotel, and then off we'll go to explore. No time for a rest. To get over jet lag, it's best to get out and do something energetic. Our first afternoon, we'll stroll around the harbour and visit the Sydney Opera House. Then we'll have a relaxed evening. Dining at Luigi's Place, one of the city's best Italian restaurants. Day two, lots of fresh air. We'll have a day trip to the Blue Mountains. Just look at these slides. Wonderful views, complete with a walk through temperate rainforests. And these pictures are Featherdale Wildlife Park, the best wildlife park in Sydney, where you can feed kangaroos, have your photo taken with koala bears. And see over two thousand different other types of Australian animals, including crocodiles, Tasmanian devils, wombats. Look at this picture of a wombat. Looks like a bear with short legs, and penguins, dingoes, and snakes. Lots of snakes. Some of Australia's snakes are the most poisonous in the world. And you can also learn about Aboriginal culture. And this is fun. Try throwing a boomerang. As the talk continues. Answer questions sixteen to twenty.
And look at these slides. Australia's Grand Canyon, the Megalong and Jamison Valleys. Incredible. On the way back, we'll get in our bus and stop at the Sydney 2000 Olympic site, where you can see Stadium Australia, the Superdome, the Aquatic Centre, the Olympic Village, and lots more. So, day two, great day. But that's not all. After that, we'll take a cruise down the Parramatta River, under the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and into Sydney Harbour. Any questions so far? OK, let's see what we'll be doing on day three. Anyone flown in a seaplane? Just a few of you. Well, a visit to Sydney would not be complete without viewing the world-famous Bondi Beach from 500 feet in the air, and this is a picture of Bondi Beach. We take off from Rose Bay, which is not far from our hotel. This should be a slide of Rose Bay. Yes, it is. You can see the seaplane taking off. Then we fly down the coast to Bondi Beach. Look at that surf. Returning back up the coast, we fly over Manly and Long Reef before returning to the harbour. Climbing to a height of 1,000 feet for a vista of Sydney Harbour, which will take your breath away. Look at this slide. And this one. Wow! And then back to Rose Bay. Then it'll be time for lunch in Chinatown. That's a great thing about Australia. It's a country of immigrants, so in the cities you can get just about any food you like. Greek, Chinese, Mexican, you name it. And perhaps you'd like to try kangaroo meat, very low fat. And after a big lunch, we'll go to walk it off in Luna Park. I can't begin to tell you how much there is to see and do here. We'll just run through a few slides. Pictures worth a thousand words, as they say, to give you an idea. Hey, I see the coffee's here. It's a bit early, not to worry. Let's all grab a cup now, and then we'll move on to Melbourne, then the Great Barrier Reef, and all the other great places on the itinerary. That is the end of Section 2. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. Listen to the conversation between Bill and Anne, two students who are discussing the talks they have to present to their social psychology class. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 25. Hi, Anne. How's it going? I'm going mad. I haven't even started preparing my talk for tomorrow's political science class. Me neither. I've been so busy looking after my mum. She's still ill? Yeah. The doctor says I should get someone to do all her cooking and cleaning for another week or so, but we can't afford to employ someone to help her. The neighbours are all too busy. It's not that I'm too busy with my other classes. That's really tough. I've got no excuses for not being prepared. Too much time playing computer games. Now, how many times have I told you? I know, I know, but at least I've got a topic. Which is? Well, it's about an experiment in Los Angeles, I think, that I read about in social studies at high school. It's about how wearing a uniform can change people's personalities. This professor got a lot of his students to agree to take part in an experiment during the summer vacation but he wouldn't tell them anything about it. As the conversation continues, answer questions 26 to 30. You now have some time to read questions 26 to 30.
Can you remember the professor's name? No, but I think he was from the University of California at Los Angeles. Well, at least you've got the most important thing, a topic. I haven't even got that. So, what happened in this experiment? Well, the prof got the local police to cooperate. One night, they went to about twenty students and arrested them. Poor guys didn't have a clue what for. And they didn't know it was the experiment they had volunteered for. They had no idea, and it had been weeks since they volunteered for the experiment. Anyway, the cops took them to a school building that had been made to look like the inside of a prison or a police station. Can't remember. It's not important. And what happened then? Did they get charged or something? Don't know. They must have been told something, but that's not the main thing. Which was? Well, what they didn't know was that about eight other students were waiting at the police station, or whatever it was, dressed up as prison guards. Hey, now I think I read about that ages ago. The experiment took place in the early seventies, and the students dressed as prison guards were told to act like prison guards. I've just thought of something. Did the arrested students know the other students? I don't know. I wouldn't have thought so. No, different schools. Because otherwise, the ones who thought they'd been arrested might have realised it was the experiment they had signed up for. Guess you're right. But then, what happened? Remember? Yeah, the guards really got into it and started treating the other guys like they see on the movies, making them do press ups, cutting their hair really short, not letting them sleep. A real power trip. The poor guys were terrified. Yeah, the experiment was supposed to last for a week, but things got out of control. Remember, the guys who thought they were prisoners, not guards, started having nervous breakdowns. Hey, look at the time. I gotta go. At least you've got something to talk about. How role playing can get real, especially when we put uniforms on. Yeah, and the students were normal, nice guys who didn't waste time with computer games. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You are going to hear a lecture about sales and marketing. You now have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Good evening, and welcome to the second class of our sales and marketing course. Tonight and in the next few weeks, I'll be talking about advertising. To be specific, about different types of advertising, different types of message, all of which, of course, are supposed to make your company or your organization, the government perhaps, more successful. Now, please note that I'm not at this stage going to talk about advertising media. There are various choices here: radio, newspapers, television, billboards, magazines, and of course, the internet. It's almost impossible to go into Google or Yahoo or whatever and not find adverts on almost every page. But we'll talk about the various choices of media later. First, I will stress one thing: advertising can be expensive. Whether you are a small business, an NGO, Or a multinational corporation, so it's very important that what you spend on advertising is money well spent, money that achieves your objectives, whatever they might be.
The ads must be cost effective. It is therefore essential to use the right type of advertising with the right message that make it effective. There are several types of advertising aiming to promote one, sometimes more, of the following things brand name, company image, a product, a service rather than a product, or a group like a manufacturer's association or a cooperative. Can you think of anything else? Right. You might want to make people look after their health better and associate your company with things that can help them do this. But the common aim is that the advertiser wants to change or reinforce people's attitudes and perceptions, and in most cases, their behavior, maybe their buying habits. Which type you choose depends on your objectives. All clear so far? Good. Okay, let's look at a very common type advertising designed to promote a brand name. If you go out to buy many types of product, toothpaste, detergent, cheese, how many of you think of the name of the company that made it? Right, you don't usually think of Procter and Gamble when you buy the company's Tide laundry detergent or Cascade dishwashing powder or the Kraft Company when you buy Philadelphia cream cheese. That's right. Philadelphia cream cheese is a registered brand name. In fact, the name of the company, Kraft, is hardly noticeable on the package. The point is that these companies have successfully promoted the name of various products, and consumers buy these products primarily because they recognize the brand name and may not even know the name of the company that makes it. So, advertising to promote a brand name? is designed to create and keep strong image in the customer's mind of the product, not the company. For example, would you buy Shell? You know, the big oil company? Would you buy Shell beer? It's a famous company, but probably not. Imagine. But what if Shell had bought a brewery and marketed a beer they called Granddad's Old Ale? You can bet that the word Shell Oil Company would be in the smallest print possible and would never be mentioned in Granddad's Old Ale advertising. But when you buy a can of Shell Oil or some gasoline, the word Shell is big and everywhere. So there is nothing better than a good brand name. Now, let's look at another type of advertising. Advertising that is designed to promote a company image. Imagine you've started a new company. You might want to start by getting the company name known first, before you worry about advertising your products and services. One company that did this was in San Francisco, the San Fran Video Store. The managers decided to promote the company name rather than promote the videos they rented out. They put small ads in local newspapers that simply said, San Fran Video Store, a great selection of movies. And they also had people handing out little cards with the same message on them, plus a list of the store locations. So they didn't spend a fortune on advertising. They put most of their money into making sure they had a great selection of movies. And it worked. They started with four stores in 1995, and now they have, at last count, 27. Now, can you think of examples of companies advertising both a product and the company name in the same advert? Come on, you must be able to think of one. What? That's right, a good example. Makers of luxury things like perfume and fashion. For example, when Chanel brings out a new perfume, the advertising message is always something like, Night Light by Chanel. This almost immediately gives the new perfume a good reputation because it's by Chanel, and also reinforces perception of the company name. So, the different types of advertising might not be mutually exclusive. The important thing is that the objectives must be clear, mutually supportive, and not contradictory. Another type of advertising is designed to promote a service rather than a physical product. But our time is up, so we'll leave that till next time. Good night, everybody. That is the end of section four. You now have some time to check your answers.
That is the end of IELTS listening. You now have ten minutes to transfer all your answers to the answer sheet. Listening test four. You'll hear a number of different recordings, and you'll have to answer the questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you'll have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the question booklet. At the end of the test, you'll be given ten minutes to transfer all your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a police detective questioning Mrs. Jones about a crime. Look at questions one to five on the form. Now. Form now. You will see that an example has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this question will be repeated. Hi, I'm Detective Smith. I can see you are upset, but I must ask you a few questions about the robbery. Yes, I understand. I'll try to control myself. It was so sudden. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have another chance to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer the questions one to five. Hi, I'm Detective Smith. I can see you are upset, but I must ask you a few questions about the robbery. Yes, I understand. I'll try to control myself. It was so sudden. I understand. Why don't we sit down and get a cup of tea? Yes, thank you. It's okay. I'm a bit better now. Good. These things can be very disturbing, but we'll take our time. First, I need a few particulars. Let me see. Today is January seven. Now, may I have your name? Yes, Mrs. Mary Susan Jones. Thank you. Age, thirty-eight. And your home address, Mrs. Jones. Yes, it's thirty-nine Rose Garden Terrace. Telephone numbers. I only have a home number, four eight three four six two nine zero. Okay. I only came out to buy some milk. I never dreamed. Yes. Now try to relax. What time did you come into the shop, Mrs. Jones? It was exactly eleven fifteen. I looked at my watch just before coming into the shop. I was worried I might not get home in time to make my husband's lunch. Look at question six to ten. Now listen to more of the conversation between the police officer and Mrs. Jones, and answer questions six to ten. And before you entered the shop, can you remember seeing anything unusual? No, but as soon as I came in, this man walked out very quickly, nearly pushed me over. Then I saw poor Williams, the owner. I'm so glad he's not badly hurt. No, just a bump on the head. Now, this man you saw—could you say how tall he was? Well, I only came up to his shoulder, and I'm five feet four, so he must be about—I don't know—six feet. And you're not wearing high-heeled shoes, so yes, that's about right. But we have to use the metric system now, so that makes him about a hundred and eighty centimeters. 
Did you see his face? Not really. I didn't look up. I was so annoyed. But I do know he was wearing a black hat. I saw it as he was walking out of the door. One of those things cowboys wear. Did you notice what color hair he had? I didn't really see it, what with his hat and me trying to keep my balance. What about the rest of his clothes? He had a jacket on. I think it was dark blue. No, gray. Oh dear. I can't really say for sure. It all happened so quickly. Oh, but I do know he was wearing those big basketball shoes, red and white ones, like so many young men wear nowadays. What about his trousers? His trousers. Gray? Oh dear. I can't really say. I just know they were dark. Was he fat, thin, average? Very thin, skinny. That's very useful information, Mrs. Jones. With a bit of luck, he's still around, but I expect he's got off the streets by now. I do hope you catch him. It's terrible. That is the end of section one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You're going to hear an introduction to Big Town University's resources by the head of student services. First, look at questions eleven to fifteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all here, and welcome to Big Town University. My name is Robert Black, and I'm the head of student services. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our university's many resources, especially those that are concerned with student welfare rather than academic resources and research facilities. So I'll start with my department, student services. Our offices are all in the students' union building, which I'm sure you have already discovered, because that's where the student bar and cafeteria are. Basically, our job is to help you stay well, mentally and physically. Then you can better enjoy your life here and even study sometimes. To do this, we offer a variety of services. One is our student counseling service. For many of you, it's the first time you've away from home. This can take a while to adjust to for some people, and some of you will fall in love, and then your girlfriend or boyfriend will run off with your best friend. Some people look at this philosophically and say, "Who cares? There are plenty of fish in the sea," and then get on with life. But a few will think it's the end of the world and get depressed. Then there's the pressure of your schoolwork, which usually affects not the less clever or the most hardworking students, but those who don't manage their time properly. And leave everything to the last minute. So, for these and various other reasons, some people find themselves in a depression, severe clinical depression in the worst cases. Now, it's very common for people suffering from depression to be reluctant to seek professional help. I must stress: if you find yourself in a depression that doesn't get better simply by talking it over with good friends or your parents, please come to see one of our professional counselors. They have a lot of experience in helping people get through depressions. As with all our offices, they are open during normal office hours. That's nine to five. But in cases of emergency, one of them is on call twenty-four hours a day. You can see the student services emergency number on the first page of your student handbook. Now look at questions seventeen to twenty.
As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. Well, I do hope my talking about depression hasn't made any of you feel depressed. Another one of our services is the Student Housing Office. I won't say much about this because most of you will have already dealt with the office, either to arrange accommodation in a student residence or to help you find somewhere to live off campus. We have a database of off campus housing that is updated almost daily, so if any of you are still looking, then please drop in. Now, what about fun? As you can read in the handbook, the Students' Union has dozens of clubs chess club, Chinese club, French club, choir. Conservative Club, Liberal Club, The Green Club, which works very closely with the University Maintenance Department as well as other environmental groups. And for those of you who like mountains, there's a climbing club. Well, it would take me all day to list all of our clubs and societies and, of course, all the sports teams. But I do recommend that you join one or two of them. It's a great way for new students to make new friends. Mentioning sports, our brand new fitness center opened last week and the indoor swimming pool has just been renovated. They are open from 6 a.m. to 11 at night, seven days a week, except for holidays like Christmas and the New Year. Of course, they are free of charge for students. Just show your student card. I really must recommend that you check out the new fitness center. It's got all the very latest in high-tech strength training machines, free weights room, everything you'd expect for over $25 million. Okay, we've covered counseling, housing, clubs, sports, keeping fit. What else should I mention? Oh, yes. If you're doing all these sports, climbing mountains and things, you might need to go to our sports medicine clinic. It's in the Student Health Center, which is conveniently located between the fitness center and the athletics stadium, not the football stadium. People play games and exercise seven days a week, so the clinic is open seven days a week, from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. The regular medical services in the Student Health Center are open from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., although there's always a nurse on duty for emergencies. Treatment is free only if you have registered with the Provincial Health Plan, so make sure you take your health plan card with you if you have to see the doctor. Well, I think I've covered enough for now. I won't talk about the library or the teaching facilities, because you'll sur soon learn everything you need to learn when classes start on Monday. Thank you, and good luck to you. That is the end of section two. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You're going to hear a conversation between Dick and Sue, who are two college students. They are talking about the history of flight. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 25. Hi, Sue. Wow, this is great. The Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. I'm really looking forward to doing this project on the Wright brothers. Me too. My dad was an Air Force pilot, always talking about the Wright brothers. If they hadn't invented the airplane, my dad might not have had a job. OK, let's look at the questionnaire. Where shall we start? The stuff on the Wright brothers starts over there. OK, first questions. First names, Wilbur and Orville. Everyone knows that. Then when and where they were born. Oh, and died. Let's see. Wilbur, the third son, was born on a farm in Indiana on April the 16th, 1867, and died of typhus in 1912. Pretty young, eh? Oh, and in 1965, he was selected for the Hall of Fame for Great Americans. 
Make a note of that. Okay. And what about Orville? Here we are, born in Dayton, Ohio, in 1871. Died 1948. Doesn't say why or where. We'll find out later. What's next? What got them interested in flying? As the conversation continues, please answer questions 26 to 30. You now have some time to read questions 26 to 30. It says here that their dad used to buy them lots of toys, and one was like a helicopter. And it seems that this toy helicopter first got them interested in the idea. Also, they read about this German guy who made himself a pair of large wings and managed to glide. Then they started to read everything they could get their hands on about flying and began building a plane in 1900. Next. Their first jobs? Um... They started a printing shop and also a bicycle shop. I guess they both needed some knowledge of mechanics. It helps if you want to make the world's first airplane. I suppose so. Anything else? Yeah. OK, and now the big question. When did they first fly their airplane? Well, they made a glider and flew it in 1902. But the one that made them famous was, I'll read it to you, the first ever heavier-than-air, manned-powered flight in 1903. Got the exact date there? No, just the year. We can easily find it later. Hey, but listen to this. Government bureaucrats thought they were crazy, and some engineers thought that if two bicycle mechanics could build a successful airplane, they could do it too. Hey, you write down the answers now. Let me have a read. Here's the day they first tried to fly it. Monday, December the 14th, 1903. They tossed a coin and decided that Wilbur would take the first turn as pilot. And the plane weighed 600 pounds. He started off but turned the rudder too sharply and the left wing hit the hillside. So they repaired it and Orville tried again on Thursday, December the 17th, 1903. So that was the big day. Yeah. The flight wasn't much, 12 seconds, 120 feet. I'll read what it says. But it was the first controlled, sustained flight in a heavier-than-aircraft, one of the great moments of the century. And on their third flight that day, Wilbur flew 852 feet in 59 seconds. OK, time for a coffee. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You're going to hear a talk about ecological functions of forests. You now have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to say how happy I am to have this opportunity to address this committee and hopefully contribute to our country's policy in respect to the importation and use of wood and wood products. I will start with a brief introduction to the current situation of the world's forests and then give you an overview of the various services that forests provide. By services, I mean benefits to people as well as wildlife.
Until recent years, these services have been greatly undervalued. The rate of deforestation worldwide is astounding. The Rainforest Action Network estimated in 1999 that 2.4 acres, that's one hectare, about the size of two football fields, was being lost not every day or every hour, but every second. An area larger than New York City every day, or 31 million hectares a year, an area larger than Poland. Despite the efforts of environmental groups and concerned people all over the world, the rate of deforestation has increased in recent years. The results of global deforestation are far-reaching. It means the loss of habitat for numerous species of plants and animals. It is a major factor in the warnings from scientists worldwide that. If mankind does not change how we treat our planet, 50% of species could be extinct by the middle of this century. I am sure you all know what this loss of biodiversity would mean for us humans. The loss of genetic resources would seriously threaten our food security. For example, to maintain resistance to pests and diseases, our major cereal crops—rice, corn, and wheat. Need to have genes introduced from wild relatives every few years, and who knows what new medicines we would be losing, especially with the destruction of tropical forests, which, like coral reefs and wetlands, are especially rich in biodiversity. And then there's global warming, a problem that threatens the very existence of civilization, but one which, with the exception of some northern European countries, is not treated with the urgency it deserves. Forests are important carbon sinks, taking in atmospheric carbon dioxide and storing it in their wood and the soil. Moreover, they are mostly destroyed by logging and fire. Burning releases carbon dioxide, and decaying vegetation releases methane into the atmosphere. These are both major greenhouse gases. It is estimated that one third of the increasing levels of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere come from deforestation. In addition, healthy forests and the soil under them that they protect store water when it rains and slowly release it during dry seasons. Take away the trees, and you have floods in the rainy season and drought in the dry season. We have seen more and more of this in recent years in Haiti, Indonesia, China. Look at this year's devastating floods in Bangladesh due to rapid deforestation in the Himalayas and many other countries. I have mentioned protecting the soil. Most of the landslides that killed hundreds of people and destroyed thousands of houses during the hurricane that hit Haiti this year would probably not have happened if virtually all of Haiti's forests had not been cut down for fuel. Another important ecological function of forests is their role in the hydrological cycle. Rain falls. Some of the water moves through the soil to feed streams and rivers. The rest evaporates into the air, providing moisture for clouds and rain hundreds of kilometers downwind. Break this cycle, and the people downwind have less rain for agriculture and other uses, and the people downstream face a greater risk of floods. This effect is now seen very clearly in the Amazon, Central Africa, and elsewhere. And we must not forget coral. Coral reefs are essential habitat for countless thousands of fish and other marine species. Over 50 percent of these important parts, important economically, not just beautiful things to look at, of the marine ecosystem are now damaged. The main reasons are warmer seawater, chemical pollution, and dynamite fishing. But eroded soil from deforested land that runs into the sea is another. Corals need clean water to survive. Without this, they die. So does the marine life that depends on them, and the fishermen end up with no fish and no income. And we must not forget the many millions of people who depend on healthy forests for their living. Many of these people, tribes in the Amazon, for example, have lived in harmony with the forests for thousands of years. When their jungle home is destroyed, they all too often end up as marginal people in the slums of big cities. And for us rich people, the forest environment provides us with wonderful opportunities for ecotourism, hiking, camping, bird watching, and other outdoor activities. Before we stop for coffee, I would say just one more thing. Many studies by environmental economists show that the free ecological services provided by a tree in an intact forest, reliable water supply, climate moderation, etc., 
are worth twenty to several hundred times as much as the wood when it is cut down for timber. That is the end of section four. You now have some time to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have ten minutes to transfer all your answers to the answer sheet. Listening test five. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer the questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer all your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear John and Joan talking about their new school. Look at questions one to five on the form now. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be repeated. Hi, John. How's it going? Pretty good. What about you? Terrific. So, what do you think of our new school? A one, man. Much better than the old one. In fact, I'm going to write an article for the London Times about it. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have another chance to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, John. How's it going? Pretty good. What about you? Terrific. So, what do you think of our new school? A one, man. Much better than the old one. In fact, I'm going to write an article for the London Times about it. Really? Yeah. Have you got half an hour? Maybe you should give me some ideas. If you buy me a coffee. No problem. How do you think I should start? Introduce the headmaster. Why don't you compare it with the old one? You know, the buildings, laboratories, language lab, computer equipment, fitness center, pool, stuff like that. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. I mean, the old one was pretty bad, and the new headmaster seems like a great guy. Actually, all the teachers I've met seem pretty decent. Same here. The French teacher is really cool, and he's actually French, not like Smith at the old place. He sounded less French than even you do. Hey, my accent is perfect. Dream on. But why don't you start with what the headmaster told us school this morning? You know, his ideas on education and things. Yeah, I liked that. None of that stuff about how we must study hard for our futures and the honor of the school. There's no free lunch. That type of thing. He sounds pretty progressive. What did he say? If we teachers succeed in stimulating your minds, stimulating you to ask questions and think critically, then you will discover the joy of learning, enjoy your studies, and therefore work hard. Hey, what a memory! Those are his exact words. Do you remember what he said next? Something about it's good to keep fit. Yeah. Do you remember him mentioning those experiments showing that after half an hour of exercise, our brains are much more creative for hours and put you in a better mood? Did you see the fitness center? Look at questions six to ten.
Now listen to more of the conversation between John and Joan and answer questions six to ten. I went early this morning for a workout. Fantastic! Olympic-sized pool, not like that tiny twenty-five meter thing we had before. And the gym has absolutely everything. I counted ten exercise bikes, some rowing machines, really good ones. Are you gonna go? I've been every other day for two weeks. Feel great. Hey, maybe I should interview some of the teachers and students for my article. Of course you should. Wow, just thought of it. I'm doing a video project. Maybe I could film the interviews. Makes sense. And I could take a few photos. Maybe the newspaper would use one or two of them. The main hall is awesome. Really light, lots of windows, and a huge stage, big enough for a sixty or seventy person orchestra. Did you see Mr. Clark, the old music teacher? I think he's the only teacher here from the old school. He is, and he was the only decent teacher. I met him in the hall. He's really happy, planning to double the size of the school orchestra. It's great. Okay, let's find what we're going to do. That is the end of section one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two, you are going to hear an introduction to some London parks. First, look at questions eleven to fifteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the London Park Society. It's a lovely day, so in half an hour or so, we'll go outside and start our tour of some of London's famous royal parks. But for the next half an hour or so, while we enjoy our coffee and biscuits, I'll tell you something about some of these wonderful parks. A brief history and some of their special attractions. I also have a few slides to show you. First, what do we mean by Royal Park? In short, they once belonged to or were established by order of a king or queen of England, or at least a member of the royal family. And it's a good job they did. They provide quiet and natural scenery, places that we might not be able to enjoy today if our former rulers. Had just put buildings everywhere. Let's start with the most famous Hyde Park. This park offers some of London's finest scenery and covers 630 acres and a perimeter of four miles. I know we have friends from France here, so I'd better give it in metric. That's about 260 hectares and 6.5 kilometers. Hyde Park dates back to 1536. When King Henry the Eighth got the land from the monks of Westminster Abbey, much of the later design, its layout, was done by the architect Decimus Burton in the 1820s, who took full advantage of the area's high and low land. It was the original site of the Crystal Palace, built for the Great Exhibition of 1851, the original ancestor of today's World Expos. Like the one that will be held in Shanghai in 2010, I think. So it's been popular for a long time, and not only the people who live and work near the park like it. Many famous rock bands like Pink Floyd and the Rolling Stones have put on big rock concerts here. I still remember the Rolling Stones concert there in、uh, I forget the exact year. It was around 1968 when I was a university student. Now look at questions 16 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 16 to 20. 
I mentioned the architect Decimus Burton. He designed the very impressive grand entrance to the park. The whole front is about a hundred and seven feet long. Look at the four magnificent pillars that support the central entrance, and that carving on the wall. Here's a close-up of a naval and military procession, and the gates made of iron and bronze with a beautiful Greek-style flower design. One of the most popular sites in the park is Speaker's Corner, in the northeast corner, where you can hear British people exercise their right to free speech. There may be a dozen or more at any one time, each standing on a soapbox and spouting, usually controversial views on any topic you can think of: religion, politics, fox hunting, trade unions, Europe, tourists, etc. Lots of arguing. It's great fun. And south of the Serpentine Lake is the memorial to Diana, Princess of Wales. It's an oval stone fountain that opened on July the sixth, two thousand and four. Another memorial in the southeast corner of the park is the Albert Memorial, Queen Victoria's monument to her husband of that name. I see that time is getting short, so I'll be a bit briefer with the other parks that we'll see today and tomorrow. Regent's Park. It has a fantastic landscape and is known as the jewel in the crown. Regent's Park covers 487 acres. That's 197 hectares, including Primrose Hill, and has the largest outdoor sports area in London. Rugby, basketball, soccer, netball, cricket—it's all here. St James's Park, with its royal, political, and literary associations, is at the very heart of London. It's overlooked by not one but three royal palaces. The most ancient palace is Westminster, now known as the Houses of Parliament. Then there's St James's Palace, which used to be the king or queen's residence, despite the fact that the monarch has lived in the third palace, Buckingham Palace, since 1837. There's so much to see in or by St James's Park. Bands give concerts twice a day in the park at weekends during the summer, and tomorrow is Saturday, so we're in luck. Then there's the changing of the guards. The Queen's lifeguard changes daily at Whitehall, just nearby. Monday to Saturday at 11 a.m., an hour earlier on Sundays, and at Buckingham Palace every day at 11:30 in April, May, and June, and on alternate days in July and March if the weather is okay. Finally, we'll visit Greenwich Park, which is the oldest enclosed royal park. It's situated on a hilltop with impressive views over the River Thames to the Docklands and the City of London. It contains several historic buildings, including the old Royal Observatory, the Royal Naval College, the National Maritime Museum, and the Queen's House. Well, it's time to go—a ten-minute walk, and we'll be at Hyde Park. That is the end of section two. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You are going to hear Bob asking three other students some questions for a survey. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. You now have some time to read questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Hi guys, I'm Bob. Have you got a few minutes? Sure, but what's up? Nothing much, but I've got to do a survey for my sociology class. It'd be great if you could help me out. You're students here, aren't you? Senior around campus. Yeah, economics majors. I'm Jed. I'm Sue, and I'm Anne. Hi, economics. 
I haven't made my mind up yet. It's a toss-up between sociology and environmental studies. Resource management, sustainable development, that sort of thing. Sure, but I have a class in 10 minutes. How long will it take? Well, if I start with you, I should be able to get the info I need in five minutes or so. Okay. What do you want to know? Names and stuff. Anonymous is okay. I just need your major, economics, and what year you are. We're all sophomores. The fun year. Yeah, me too. Anyway, the first thing I want to know... By the way, these are open-ended questions. You can say as much or as little as you want. Okay, fire away. Right. What do you think is the single most important problem facing the world today? I reckon it's global warming, not terrorism. I've been taking this environmental economics class, and it's really... Come on, Sue. I've told you. This climate change stuff is all a big scare cooked up by environmental groups who care more about pandas than people. So subjective... As the conversation continues, answer questions 26 to 30. You now have some time to read questions 26 to 30. You're like a tape recorder. Why don't you learn what you're talking about? Okay, guys, argue about it later. I just want to ask Sue a couple more questions so she can get to her class. What makes you think this, Sue? Well, if you read about, just check on the Internet. There's tons of information. But just look at the effects of rising temperatures on agriculture. For every degree rise in temperature above 30 degrees, there's something like a 10% drop in crop yields. So that's your main reason for... It's one of them. Sea levels could rise a meter or more by the end of the century. Think what that will mean for the billions of people who live in low-lying areas. And thousands of species could go extinct because they couldn't adapt quickly enough. I told you, she cares more about pandas than people. Jed, she mentioned all those billions of people in low places... And don't forget all the farmland that will be ruined by saltwater intrusion. You know, replacing fresh underground water. I've got to go. Why don't you see what Bob has to say? All he worries about is stock market trends. But we love you, Jed. Must go. See you. Thanks. See you. So what's your major worry, Jed? Sue kind of said it. It's a global economic slowdown so people won't have jobs. And what jobs will they have if food production drops like it could? Maybe we should do this another time. Bye, guys. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. You are going to hear a talk about Oxford and Cambridge universities. You now have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Good evening, fellow members of the New York Memory Club. Tonight I'm going to talk about those two famous English universities, Oxford and Cambridge. Let's see who wins tonight's big memory prize, which is a barrel of real English beer. 
OK, here I go. Oxford is the oldest English-speaking university in the world. There is no clear date of when it started, but records show that there was some teaching at Oxford in 1096 AD. And it developed rapidly from 1167, when King Henry II banned English students from attending the University of Paris. In 1188, a historian gave a public lecture to the top Oxford teachers, and in 1190, the first known overseas student arrived. This started the university's tradition of international exchanges. In 1231, the masters, meaning the teachers, were recognised as a universitas, which is Latin for something like a corporation. In the 13th century, conflict between town and gown, meaning ordinary townspeople and students, the students wore gowns, accelerated the establishment of halls of residence like dormitories. This led to the Oxford colleges, of which University, Balliol and Merton colleges, established between 1249 and 1264, are the oldest. Less than a century later, Oxford was the most famous centre of learning in the world. It soon became a centre for religious and political disputes. John Wycliffe, a 14th century master of Balliol College, campaigned for a Bible in common English. The pro-Latin leaders of the Catholic Church in Rome were very angry over this, and even more angry when, in 1530, King Henry VIII forced Oxford University to accept his divorce from Catherine of Aragon. In the late 17th century, the Oxford philosopher John Locke, suspected of treason, was forced to leave England. The 18th century was an age of scientific discovery and religious revival. For example, a geometry professor at Oxford, Edmund Halley, successfully predicted the return of the comet that was named after him. I don't have enough time to tell you much more about Oxford University, but I must tell you that from 1878, academic halls were established for women. Since 1974, only one of Oxford's 39 colleges has not accepted both men and women. St Hilda's College remains the only women's college. Now for a few numbers. The University of Oxford has over 17,000 students. A quarter of these students are from outside the UK, 5% from Asia, 8% from North America, 10% from other European countries and a few from elsewhere. Oxford University currently has students from more than 130 countries. Over 5,600 students are engaged in postgraduate work. Of these, around 3,000 are working in the arts and humanities. Going back to the colleges, of which there are 39, there are also seven permanent private halls, which were founded by different Christian denominations and which still retain their religious character. 30 colleges and all seven halls admit students for both undergraduate and graduate degrees. Seven other colleges are for graduates only. One, All Souls, has fellows only, and one, Kellogg College, specialises in part-time graduate and continuing education. OK, that's enough for Oxford. Now I'll tell you something about Cambridge University. The town itself has its origins in the 1st century BC, when an Iron Age tribe established a settlement on Castle Hill. Later, the Romans took over this site, which was an important strategic point, and was the meeting point of several important Roman roads. Over a thousand years later, the Normans, from France, built a castle here. All that remains of this castle nowadays is the small hill that was inside the castle walls. In the 12th century, students attended schools attached to the monasteries and cathedrals, and as universities developed in Italy and France, scholars moved from one centre to another. Some went from Paris to Oxford, and later, in the 13th century, groups arrived in Cambridge. By the middle of the 12th century, there were enough students there for the town to be officially recognised as a seat of learning. In fact, in 1231, King Henry III wrote out orders on how academic life in the town was to be managed. At this time, students had to make their own arrangements for living accommodation. Because it was difficult to find a de decent place to live, hostels, like simple small hotels, were set up for them, and from these the college system evolved. The first college was Peterhouse, founded by a bishop, the Bishop of Ely. Just like in Oxford, as the university grew and took over more of the town, 
there were outbreaks of trouble between town and gown. Well, my time is nearly up, so I'll fast forward to the late 1800s, when two colleges were founded for women, but it was not until the late 1940s that they were awarded degrees. A third women's college was founded in the 1950s, but it was not until the 1970s that other colleges began to accept female students. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have ten minutes to transfer all your answers to the answer sheet. Listening test six. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer the questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer all your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one, you will hear Bud and Annie talking about their families. Look at questions one to five, one to five on the form now. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be repeated. Hi, Annie. How are things? Awful, Bud. Awful. Why? What's happened? It's home. Mum's ill, and Dad's been laid off, so he's in a really bad mood. And Susan won't be of any help. Your sister always was lazy. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have another chance to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, Annie. How are things? Awful, Bud. Awful. Why? What's happened? It's home. Mum's ill, and Dad's been laid off, so he's in a really bad mood. And Susan won't be of any help. Your sister always was lazy. But what's wrong with your mum? She seemed fine last time I saw her. Everything. I think she's really down because of Dad, and her arthritis is playing up again. It seemed the new medicine was working fine. Now she can still move her fingers, but hardly walk. Her toes hurt, and the doctor says she needs a knee replacement. Doesn't sound too good. That's expensive surgery. Got medical insurance. She was covered by my dad's, but that's finished since he lost his job, and money's really tight. A new knee costs about ten thousand bucks, so she'll have to put up with it for a while. God, that's awful. Maybe I should mention it to my uncle, the one who used to work at the hospital. What could he do? I don't know, but. He knows all the doctors, and maybe there's a way your mum could get the operation done cheaply. It'll have to be really cheap, 'cause they're having a problem paying the mortgage, and my sister won't help out. She's so selfish. Well, I'll give a try.、Uh, but what's this problem with your sister? Since she won that beauty competition, she thinks she's been acting so high and mighty. Won't even help mum with the housework. Look at questions six to ten.
Now listen to more of the conversation between Bud and Annie and answer questions 6 to 10. Won't help your mum? No, spends all her time in front of the mirror, trying on different lipsticks. Sounds like my cousin. You know her, I think, Marianne, who works at the Holiday Inn. Yeah, I met her at your party, but she seemed very nice. She is till you get to know her, Miss Charming. But she's really conceited, especially since she got promoted. Always putting people down. What about your dad's company? Do you think he might have some work for my dad? Part-time, anything? He just got this big contract for the new supermarket, so he might be looking for some people. And I know he likes your dad, but all his workers have to be steelworkers union members. I think Dad's kept his membership up. I'll ask him. Let me know, and I'll check with Dad when he gets back from France. France? Yeah, he took Mum there as a 25th wedding anniversary present. Gosh, it's 5.30. I'm late for work. Gotta fly. See you, bud. See you. That is the end of section one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a bank manager talking about money management. First, look at questions 11 to 15. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to one of the Hong Kong's bank's lectures on money management. I'm John Rogers, and I'm the manager here. Money, they say, makes the world go round. Well, it is true that your world can come to a grinding halt if you have no money. I know you all agree because that is why you have come here today. Okay, money. What do we want to do with it? Most people want to enjoy the money they earn today, but also put some aside for a rainy day, the kids' education, that big house in the country you've always dreamed of, and, of course, retirement. In other words, they want to invest it. So let's talk for a little while on spending money wisely today and then I'll talk about the various types of investment you can make. The first question is, how much of your income should you enjoy spending today, and how much should you save for the future? And the answer is different for different people. It depends on things like age, your health, how many children you have, etc. Well, my initial answer is, write out a budget for the necessities. food rent, mortgage, and loan payments, clothing, health insurance, things like that. When most people do this, they say to themselves, My goodness, I really only need to spend 1,500 pounds a month. So how come I always spend nearly two and a half thousand? My mother used to tell me, Look after the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves. What to do? Discipline. I suggest you take out the cash you need every week from the bank and keep a record of what you buy with your credit card. And you must strictly limit what you spend every month to, for example, your budget for essentials, plus an amount, say 10%, for a bit of entertainment, if you want, and the unexpected, like house repairs, that birthday present you forgot about, things like that. If after three weeks you find that you have nearly spent your budget for the month, 
Then stay at home for a week. No fancy restaurants or drinking with the boys. As they say, there's no free lunch. As the talk continues, answer questions 16 to 20. Okay, so what do you do with the money you don't spend? Oh, one thing I forgot to mention. It's a good idea to always have some money in a current deposit at the bank in case of big surprises. Say a thousand or so. Don't be tempted to use your credit card unless you absolutely have to. And get that safety cushion back in the bank as soon as you can. Right, so what should you invest in? The list is endless. Real estate, stocks and shares, equity funds. Did I hear someone say gambling? Well, if you have a crystal ball, maybe. The government lottery? Someone once described it as a voluntary tax on fools. But I must admit I spend a pound or two on it every week. But no more. It brings a little bit of excitement into my life even though I know I have a better chance of being struck by lightning than winning. Okay, let's start off with a basic principle. In general, the higher the potential for making a fortune by buying shares of a particular company, the one you have been told will be the next IBM in three weeks, the higher the risk. We've all heard about the dot-com bubble of several years ago. Some people made a fortune, but they got out before the market crashed. The majority of investors lost their shirts. Another basic principle, the balanced portfolio. A balanced portfolio means you have investments in a variety of things, from low-risk but low-return things, to things like blue-chip stocks that are somewhat less predictable, but which will probably provide steady, if not spectacular, returns for years, to the riskiest of all, venture capital, where success could increase the value of your investment a hundredfold, or failure could wipe it out. Well, why don't we break for a coffee now? Then I will talk about the most common form of share ownership, common stock, which makes you become a part owner of the company itself, with voting rights and entitlement to dividend distribution if there is one. That is the end of section two. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a college professor and two students talking about a course on shooting video projects. First listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 25. Hi, guys. Hi, Hi Professor, Professor Edwards. Edwards. What's, happening? What's happening? Well, the department head just told me I've got to teach this course on making video documentaries. I know you two are really into videos. That documentary you made last term on homeless people was fantastic. And I've never thought this course before. I'm an old-fashioned film man, so I thought I'd get some suggestions from you on how to design this course. Well, I don't know if we can be much help, but we'll try. How exactly do you think we can help you? I suppose the first thing is, how much do most of the students know about video cameras? I don't want to waste time telling them stuff they already know. Actually, 
Some of them have video cameras, but they only use them for home movies, that type of thing. Yeah, I don't think many of them know much about their cameras, just point and shoot. So maybe I should start with the basics of the video camera. I think so. Otherwise, they will just put the thing on automatic and lose out on a lot of really good things you can do if you control the camera more yourself. I agree. But do you expect everyone to have their own video camera? Too expensive for a lot of them. But they can rent them. Doesn't cost too much. Five to fifteen pounds a day, I think. Depends on the model. The thing I'm most interested in is getting them to plan their projects properly and be creative in their use of what they've got. Doesn't the film department have some cameras students can use? I checked that out. They've only got three. Probably not enough. Do you think they need broadcast quality cameras? You know, three CCDs, expensive stuff. As the conversation continues, answer questions 26 to 30. You now have some time to read questions 26 to 30. No need. Single CCD. A bit of zoom. Wide angle for indoor stuff and scenery. Basic functions will do. You mean camera angles. Shooting from interesting positions. Creative lighting. That sort of thing. Kind of. But that's much the same as you teach in your film courses. Guess you're right. But I want to think of things you can do with a video camera that you can't do with a film camera. Aha! Secret shooting. Much easier to film people without their knowing with a tiny video camera than it is with a big film camera. Make a little hole in your pocket and off you go. And if you're not happy with something, you just erase it and do it again, if you can. Good point. But there's a question of privacy here. Is it fair to film people without their knowing? Unless you're a cop or something. I suppose it's not. But it's often the only way to get what you want. I don't worry about these things. I just want to make good movies. Can't always do that if people know you're filming them. Well, I've never been taken to court for filming people without their knowing. But I agree, sometimes you have to. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You are going to hear a lecture about various issues in land management and ownership systems by Professor Fred Roberts. You now have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Good morning everyone, good to see you all looking so full of energy. Today I'm going to give an overview of some general principles and issues relating to land management and ownership. Very important. If we look at history, it seems that much of it concerns conflict over religion, economic power and land. Often all three factors are involved together. The first question one asks when talking about land is, who owns it? What you can do with land you own depends on one's political views. A far-right conservative may say ownership is the socially supported power to do what you want with the land you own, with no control by government, as long as what you do with it doesn't hurt others. You can imagine how different factions interpret hurt others. By contrast, the political left, socialists and, more to the left, communists, say land ownership, private land ownership that is, is the root cause of much injustice in the world. and 
that the social protection of private land ownership can result in tyranny and oppression. They therefore argue for state, public and cooperative forms of land ownership. I would mention here that most of us take for granted the idea that everything must be owned by a person, people or an organisation. But some societies, notably some native North American tribes, seem to have no concept of personal ownership. It was normal for them simply to take anything they needed and for others to take it from them if they needed it. When European settlers came, the Indians behaved as usual, which led the Europeans to seeing them as thieves. But the European settlers grabbed the Native Americans' land, their most important possession. So who were the real thieves? However, in this day and age, it would be futile to think of getting rid of the concept of ownership. But let me return to land ownership. It's a complex issue. For example, should the owner have exclusive control over the rights of way, like traditional footpaths, or the migration routes of wild animals, or the ecologically important wetlands? Should the owner be allowed to destroy the whole lot by building expensive houses everywhere? Or what if the owner discovers hidden treasure that once belonged to the royal family? All such things raise questions of the rights of the owner as opposed to the rights of others, including animals, perhaps. Clearly, divergent views on such questions are a constant source of argument. What did the classical economists say about land ownership? Their positions were often rather ambiguous. Many of them seemed to consider it a necessary evil and argued that it could not be defended if there was not some obligation to keep and improve the land. This is the concept of stewardship, that the land must be kept in good condition for future generations. But what if the owners were good stewards of their vast estates, but millions were going hungry? The Marxist answer was, and still is, land reform as a means of social justice. And in the 20th century, I mentioned ecological issues just now. Other reasons for legally restricting the rights of landowners have emerged. You can't cut the trees down because it would cause soil erosion that can spoil rivers hundreds of miles away. Pollution, the need to protect biodiversity, things that reduce the level of what we called nature's services to the general public, all have led to more restrictions on landowners' rights, at least in some countries, especially Europe. At the same time, property taxes have steadily increased to pay for essential services offered by the state or local government, such as firefighting. As these threats to the health of our planet get more serious, some people have argued that the ownership of natural capital, forests, wetlands, etc., will more and more be controlled by communal and not by private bodies. For example, the use by multinational companies of native plant varieties for modified crops and new drugs, plants that they seldom paid for in the past, are now increasingly recognised as belonging to the cultures or ecosystems from which they originated. But it seems to me that having the land and its flora and fauna owned by governments is no guarantee that they'll be used wisely, rather than for short-term profit. The evidence is that local ownership protected by law is usually the best answer. OK, it will soon be time for a break, but before we have our coffee, I will give the answers to the two questions I asked you last time. What are the differences between leasehold and freehold? Essentially, the former allows possession for a limited time, while the latter is a special right granting the full use of real estate for an indeterminate time. In this country, most houses are sold with the land and the house itself freehold, whereas many flats are sold with a lease which was issued by the freeholder to the original leaseholder. The flat is then effectively owned by the leaseholder for an agreed number of years. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer all your answers to the answer sheet.
Listening test seven. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer the questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer all your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear Miss Penny Jones being interviewed for a job by Mr. White. Look at questions one to five on the form now. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be repeated. Good morning, Miss Jones. I'm David White, our personnel manager. Good morning. Ah,、oh, please take a seat. Thank you. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have another chance to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Miss Jones. I'm David White, our personnel manager. Good morning. Ah,、oh, please take a seat. Thank you. Well, did you manage to find us easily enough? Oh, no problem. But the traffic was terrible. I was terrified I'd be late. Well, you made it on time, so no problem. How did you get here? I took the bus, but even the bus lane was blocked. I know the problem. Well, let's start with a few personal details to make sure everything on the printout of your application form is correct. Our computers have been doing funny things lately. Full name: Penny Ann Jones. Yes, that's correct. British citizen. Date of birth: January the third, nineteen eighty. That's right. And your address: twenty-eight Green Lane, Oxford. Actually, no. That's my old address.、Uh, I was living there when I applied, but now I've moved to flat five o two fifty six Rose Gardens. But it's still in Oxford. Okay, I'll just change that. Good. And is your home phone the same? Yes, seven nine eight four eight six five. And your email: Jenny twenty seven at hotmail dot com. Yes, that's it. Look at questions six to ten. Now listen to more of the conversation between Ms. Penny Jones and Mr. White, and answer questions six to ten. And you have a first-class honours degree in public health management from Keele University. Yes. What made you choose this major, Ms. Jones? Well, both my parents are doctors, and I got my interest in health and things from them. But I wasn't sure that I wanted to be a doctor myself. At the same time, I wanted to be involved in the health field, and I thought public health management would be ideal. Also, I've always been interested in politics and the environment, so I figured this would allow me to satisfy various interests. I can't disagree. Us workers in the county public health department are often faced with a health threat from pollution or unsafe working conditions. We try to do something about it, and most companies or government departments are very cooperative. But it's not unusual to find a company that isn't. They start threatening things like loss of jobs, and of course, that's always a political hot potato, especially with unemployment running around eleven percent in the country. So, what do you think about such things, Miss Jones? Well, I think the first thing is that some companies think meeting environmental standards is expensive. But so many companies find that they can reduce costs by adopting cleaner technologies, seeing waste as resources, that sort of thing. And as for dangerous or unhealthy working conditions, 
If they don't get fined, then sooner or later there will be a big lawsuit, which is always expensive, even if they win. Good, I agree. Oh, how rude of me!、Uh, would you like a cup of tea, coffee, or something? A coffee would be lovely. That is the end of section one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two, you are going to hear an introduction to a kindergarten. First, look at questions eleven to sixteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to sixteen. Good afternoon, everybody. First, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the Sunny Skies Nursery School. My name is Doris Matthews, and I'm the headmistress. First of all, I'll describe our philosophy of early education, along with our teaching principles. I'll try not to sound like a teacher giving a lecture. Then we'll have a tour of the school and finish with tea and sandwiches in the staff room, where you can meet our teachers and administrative staff. They will all be very happy to meet you and answer any questions you might have. First, as you know, we base our teaching, or should I say, learning. Because we try to help our children discover and learn for themselves, rather than simply try to teach them facts, we base our efforts on the principles discovered by that wonderful Italian educator and doctor, Maria Montessori. This means we believe learning best takes place in an atmosphere in which the children interact a lot and learn from each other. This encourages them. To be lifelong learners and problem solvers, for decades many studies have shown that children and even us adults learn through the senses. Our children learn by manipulating materials, toys, sand, blocks, almost anything, and interacting with others. They have fun as they learn, and these experiences help them to form on their own. With of course a little bit of help from the teacher, abstract ideas. We try to cultivate the whole person, believing that the spiritual, emotional, physical, cognitive, and social interests and needs are all equally important and interdependent. We also do our best to foster respect for each other and the environment. We find that our school garden, where they learn the magic of life, the need to recycle organic resources, how sad that so many people around the world think their kitchen waste is just that waste, and maintain healthy soil for growing our food. But you'll see for yourselves. You'll be able to taste some of our home-grown tomatoes and things when we have a snack in the staff room. Some of our children's most magical moments have been when they see the seeds they planted sprouting up through the soil. Now look at questions seventeen to twenty. As the talk continues. Answer questions seventeen to twenty. Well, that's enough about our philosophy and method of education. 
I'm sure we'll enjoy chatting about it some more when we meet the staff. Now I'd like to show you around. It's a lovely day, so we'll start with the vegetable garden. I'm sure you've all guessed that we are very proud of our garden. You can see it outside the balcony. It's on the south side of the school, so it gets lots of sun. On the left, the east side, you can see the classroom block. Actually, we don't see them as classrooms in the normal sense. They are more like activity and play centers. And on the opposite side, we have the dining hall and the kitchen. Behind us, across the courtyard, we have the offices and the staff room. So, out we go. So, here we are in our garden. We grow all the vegetables we need for the children's and the staff's lunches for the whole year. The greenhouse you see over there is a great help in the winter and spring. I can't begin to tell you how much the children love their garden, and they learn so much. Not just how to grow things, but also arithmetic, weights, and measures. They love seeing how heavy the biggest tomato or potato or whatever it is. They also love getting dirty, but doctors tell us that's good for the healthy development of strong immune systems. Have you read those reports about how kids who never come into contact with a bit of dirt or with animals? Are much more likely to suffer from asthma. It's fascinating, but don't worry. We make sure they have a good wash before they go home. So, shall we have a look at the classrooms now? We have small classes, usually no more than ten children per class, but we also have a lot of activities in which the whole school joins in: sports, running around the outside of the school to warm up on a winter's day. Singing, we always enjoy a song or two when we have our daily morning assembly in the assembly hall. Okay, here we are in the first classroom. You see the ten or so small foam rubber mattresses over there by the cupboard, and we have blankets inside the cupboard. They are for after lunch, when we like the children to have an hour's sleep. Then they have lots of energy. Until it's time to go home. Oh, I just saw Miss Robbins taking the sandwiches to the staff room. Let's go there now and meet the staff. They are always so excited to meet our children's parents. That is the end of section two. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three, you will hear three students talking about revising for exams. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. You now have some time to read questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Hi, Bob. Hi, Harry. Where's Jill? I really need her. She's the brainy one. Me too, but she's always late. I think that's her. I'd recognize her footsteps anywhere. Good morning, boys. Sorry, I'm a bit late. I was photocopying some things that you might find useful for reviewing for the exams. I know you missed those lectures. Been waiting long? The traffic is so heavy. Nah, just got here. Good. Okay, but I'm really busy, so why don't we start? I know you wanted these photocopies, but what else? This is a bit embarrassing, Jill. But Bob and I are really worried about these exams. 
I haven't prepared for them, and we only have two weeks. My parents will kill me if I don't pass. Same here. The thing is, you always do so well in exams, and, uh. Well, we know you know a lot about studying and things, so we thought you might be able to give us a few tips. A few tips? If you both spent more time with your books and went to classes, you wouldn't need any tips. You think the bar is more important. Yeah, well, but we'd be really grateful if you. you know. We really need your help, Jill. Okay, okay. I know you too, guys. The first thing you have to do is organize your time. You're both so disorganized, and you don't have your priorities right. Having fun is always more important. I know, I know. But I'm really going to do what you tell us, Jill. Got no choice. Me too. I can only make a few suggestions. Really simple ones. Basic stuff. Obvious. But it's obvious you two don't have a clue. Ready for Mummy's talk? I guess so. Yeah. As the conversation continues, answer questions 26 to 30. You now have some time to read questions 26 to 30. Organize your time. Set aside a time for 40 minutes for exercise every day and stick to it. Is that too difficult? I guess not. And no going partying or to the pub every night, okay? This is sounding difficult. Okay, fail your exams, then tell your mom and dad. No, we're listening, Jill. Right. No parties or drinking for three weeks, agree? Yeah, guess so. What else? As soon as I've gone, write down a timetable. Eating time, exercise time, sleeping time. We've only got one or two classes left before the exams, so most of the rest of the time you can spend reviewing, but you have to stick to it. We will, but then what? Don't try to learn or review everything in one go. And take a five minute break every hour. Get up and walk around. You should know all this. I suppose I do, but I never actually did it. Same here. And one last thing. For five or ten minutes every hour. Are you going to review together? Guess so. For the last few minutes, tell each other what you've learned in the past 40 minutes. That really helps it stick in your memory. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You are going to hear a presentation on suggestions for the facilities required in a school that is to be built. You now have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. Members of the Green Forest Golf and Country Club, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Parker Education Research Company, it is my pleasure to present you with the results of our feasibility study and recommendations for the facilities of the new private school that you are considering having built in Green Forest. First, the green light, our feasibility study. It shows that building the school makes economic sense. It would be a good investment. 
May I briefly explain how we came to this conclusion, how we conducted our study? There are just over 7,500 households in Green Forest and a population of 31,000. If you look at the graph on the screen, you will see that the average annual income of these households last year was £83,000 a year, which is far above the national average of £41,000. We did a random survey of 10% of the 3,200 families with a household income of over 50,000 and found that they had an average of 0.33 children between the ages of 8 and 12, the age of local children who would be most likely to attend the school, which, if the project is approved, will open in two years' time. So this means there are about 1,000 children in Green Forest who will be of the right age, and with parents who could probably afford it, to attend the proposed new private school. After explaining the concept, we found that just over one-third of these parents are very enthusiastic about sending their children to the type of school that you have in mind. The rest were not sure, or completely satisfied with the state schools. We did not do a survey in the two nearby towns, but seeing that they also have a high percentage of quite wealthy people, roughly the same demographics, and have no nearby top-class schools to which to send their children, we are confident that at least 50, probably nearer 100 pupils could be attracted from these towns as students when the school opens. This means there are at least 300 local students whose parents would be very keen on sending them to the proposed new school. This would be enough to make the school break even in the second year. As new classrooms and other facilities were added in the second and third years, especially two residences, one for male and one for female students from elsewhere in the country and overseas, then the economic prospects look even better. I mention facilities, and I know you have been discussing this a lot among yourselves. Our survey shows that there are several essential facilities that almost all the people we questioned would require before sending their children here. I will not list them in any order of importance. They are all seen to be very important. The first is a good language lab. Very few of the parents we spoke to are fluent in a foreign language and do not want their children to be the same. It seems most of them mention the word globalization and see the importance of foreign languages, and not just French and other European languages. Many of them mention Chinese. Another essential is good sports facilities, including an Olympic-sized indoor swimming pool and a well-equipped gym. A lot of the parents were overweight. I guess they don't want their kids to get in the same way. Two multiple-use pitches one for rugby and soccer, the other for field hockey and athletics, would be required. Fortunately, the land for these would not be a problem as the governors and members of this golf and country club have agreed that the golf practice range is far bigger than needed, and part of it could be used for these outdoor sports. In addition, the location is ideal, right next to the proposed site of the school itself. Another and very obvious requirement is that the school have a state-of-the-art computer study center. It would not have to be big enough to accommodate more than, say, 10% of the students at any one time, because virtually all of them have their own computers at home. But no computer games, unless they are educational, was a frequent response to the computer studies question. I know that several of you work for large computer companies, so maybe you could use your influence to keep costs down and quality high. A cafeteria? Interestingly enough, one thing some people mentioned, perhaps it's a bit early to worry about this, was that they would not want their children to have access to fast food. Other things, all of which are seen as essential, and that we have included in the budget, are a good-sized main hall, with a large stage for school drama productions, etc., and good facilities for music, pianos, everything for a school orchestra, 
all the things many of the parents didn't have when they were young. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have ten minutes to transfer all your answers to the answer sheet. Listening test eight. You'll hear a number of different recordings, and you'll have to answer the questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you'll have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the question booklet. At the end of the test, you'll be given ten minutes to transfer all your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a telephone conversation between Yuki, a Japanese student in Japan, in Japan, and Mrs. Gray in London, England, who will provide homestay accommodation for Yuki. Look at questions one to five on the form now. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first and repeated. Hello, the Gray residence. Hello, you are Mrs. Gray. Yes. Who's calling? I am Yuki Kitashima in Tokyo. Oh, I'm so happy you called. The homestay officer at the college told me you would call in a day or two. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have another chance to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello, the Gray residence. Hello, you are Mrs. Gray. Yes. Who's calling? I am Yuki Kitashima in Tokyo. Oh, I'm so happy you called. The homestay officer at the college told me you would call in a day or two. Yes, I am very happy to speak with you, Mrs. Gray. I hope I am not calling at an inconvenient time. No, it's perfect. I've just got back from taking the dogs for a walk and put the kettle on for a cup of tea. What time is it where you are, Yuki? It is three o'clock in the morning, Mrs. Gray. Oh dear! You waited up all this time to call me. It is seven p.m. in London, I think. Exactly. My English teacher told me this is a good time to call English people. They have just had their dinner and then watch television or go to the pub. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, Fred, that's my husband. He's working a bit late tonight, so we'll go out for dinner when he gets back, probably in an hour or so. Now you've called. We'll have to have Japanese food to celebrate. Oh, you are too kind, Mrs. Gray. So I should go out for fish and chips, yes? So lovely, us eating sushi in London and you eating fish and chips in Tokyo. I don't know what Richard and Anne will have. Richard and Anne? Oh, how silly of me! Yes, they are our two children. Richard is seventeen and Anne is nineteen, just about your age. Yes, I am just twenty, Mrs. Gray. Look at question six to ten.
Now listen to more of the conversation between Mrs. Gray and Yuki, and answer questions six to ten. I know they are both so looking forward to seeing you. They have lots of friends. John's in his last year at high school, and Anne has just started university near here. What is Anne studying, Mrs. Gray? Well, you wouldn't believe this: Japanese language and culture. In fact, that's one reason we thought it would be nice to have another homestay student from Japan. She can't wait to meet you, and nor can Richard. I'm sure you will all get on famously together. Your room is all ready. Thank you, Mrs. Gray. Oh, Yuki, have you booked your flight yet? All booked. Great. When can we expect you? Let me get a pen. We'll all meet you at the airport. Thank you so much. I arrive at Heathrow Airport next Wednesday, the fifteenth, at ten thirty a.m. Your flight, Yuki. Japan Airlines JA two six seven four. I will go to the travel agent this morning to pick up my ticket. Then I will confirm details by email. Lots of luggage, Mrs. Gray. No problem, Yuki. We'll write a big sign so you can recognize us. We are sure you will feel at home with us. Thank you very much, Mrs. Gray. That is the end of section one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two, you're going to hear the immigration officer at a British embassy explaining the visa application process to a group of people who wish to go to the United Kingdom. First, look at questions eleven to sixteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to sixteen. Good morning. I'm the head visa officer here. Welcome to our monthly talk on applying for British visa. We used to give everybody photocopies of the different forms you have to fill in, but found that that was rather expensive. So to save money and paper, we now use slides that you can see on the screen behind me. By the way, this and the other forms you will see are the same forms that you will see if you go online to UK Visas. That's one word. dot gov. dot uk. They are very similar to the hard copy you will find in our offices. The first question: Do you need a visa to enter the UK? If you are not a British citizen. Or a citizen of one of the European Economic Area countries, you may need an entry clearance before you travel to the UK. Entry clearance means the application process for people who need a visa to travel to the United Kingdom, and for those who don't need a visa for a short stay. How short is depends on their nationality, but who intend a longer stay or to settle in the UK. People from certain countries, known as visa nationals, the first type I mentioned, need an entry clearance to enter the UK for any reason. Those from other countries need only one for certain reasons. For example, to live as the wife or husband of a British citizen. The entry clearance certificate, that we all call a visa, is placed in your passport or travel document. The job of an entry clearance officer at a British embassy or consulate or other mission overseas is to decide if you qualify for entry before you travel to the United Kingdom. These officers stick to very strict rules and procedures. If you need to find out more, then you can click on the Immigration Rules and Diplomatic Service Procedures Entry Clearance. 
If you have a valid UK visa, you will not normally be refused entry to the UK on arrival unless your circumstances have changed, you gave false information, or you did not tell the entry clearance officer important facts when you applied for your visa. So let's assume that you have your entry visa, which, by the way, is only valid up to a certain date. At your UK port of arrival, the visa tells the immigration officer there the purpose of your travel, how long you can stay in the UK, and the latest date that you can enter the UK. Normally, you may enter and leave the UK as many times as you like during the validity of your visa. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. OK, let's go back to the question. Do you need a visa? If you look on the screen now, you will see a picture of the first page of the form. Do I need a UK visa? We find that a few people spend hours filling out visa application forms only to discover that they don't need a visa. You can use this questionnaire to find out if you need a visa or entry clearance to enter or transit through the UK. Please note that the rules can change sometimes, so it's a good idea to visit the news page and the Visa and DATV Nationals page. You can see that this is recommended on the form. Going down the form, we see the Purpose of Visit section, Au Pair, Business, Doctor, Medical Treatment, to see one's fiancé, returning resident, student for more than six months, and dozens more. I must stress again that it is very important that you answer all the questions truthfully and accurately. Even an accidental mistake can ruin your chances of getting a visa, possibly forever. Next, we have country of nationality. Please note that this refers to the passport you hold or that you will hold, and not to where you are living or staying now. That is the next question, current location, which is quite simple. So as well helping you find out if you need a visa, you can also find out where you should make your application, as well as which application form you need to fill in, and which guidance note you should read. Now, some of you here I know wish to sponsor a visitor to the UK, and others of you have a sponsor for your visit. The basic rules applying to a sponsored visitor are 1. He or she wishes to stay in the UK as a visitor for no more than six months. 2. He or she intends to leave the United Kingdom on completion of his or her visit. And 3. He or she has enough money to live without working and without needing help from public funds such as income support or housing benefit. That is the end of section 2. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You're going to hear a market researcher asking an elderly couple in a shopping mall about how their environmental awareness affects their shopping decisions. Listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 25.
Good morning, madam, sir. My name is Bob Smith. I'm doing a survey of people's shopping preferences and how it relates to their thoughts about the environment. I'd be very grateful if you could spare a few minutes of your time. The environment, you say? Well, I think it's very important. It's terrible what's happening. You can pick up a newspaper without reading about melting ice caps and tigers going extinct. I'm very worried about my grandchildren's future. Oh, don't carry on, dear. Are we going to help this gentleman, or do you have to get to your meeting? It's the environment. Of course, we're going to help him. My meeting can wait. Looks like we can spare you a few minutes. By the way, what's your name again, Bob? Right, Bob. I'm John, and this is Joan. Great. Good to meet you. You don't mind me asking who you are doing this for and what the purpose is. I don't want to go out giving information that will help those big corporations sell more junk food to children. Don't worry, it's the opposite. I work for the Green Market Research Company based in West London. We specialize in helping environmentally responsible companies tell consumers why they should buy their products. Rather than products that have a more damaging effect on the environment. Well, that's a good thing. All those poisons the big companies are putting in our food and air. Have you read about the polar bears and seals in the Arctic having very high levels of PCBs, pesticides, and lots of other terrible things in them? And there are no factories where they live. It's okay, dear. Why don't we see what the gentleman wants to know? As the conversation continues, answer questions twenty-six to thirty. You now have some time to read questions twenty-six to thirty. Yes, well, thank you, sir. Look, why don't we sit down at that table? Can I get you a coffee, tea, or something? Oh, I'd love a cup of tea. My husband always has black coffee. Sure. Anyway, can I begin by asking you what you believe is the most serious environmental problem humans are facing nowadays? Well, there are so many, but since I retired, I've been doing a lot of reading about this. So much information on the internet. I think it's climate change, global warming. Global warming, and John,、uh, may I call you John? Please do. And does this make any difference to your shopping decisions? It certainly does. For example, we bought a new fridge a week ago. We're both pensioners, so we're a bit careful about how we spend our money. We had already decided we didn't need such a big fridge. We'd had the old one since the kids left home over twenty years. But we also decided to look for the most energy-efficient fridge. Yes, it cost twenty pounds more than the second most efficient one. But John worked out we would soon save more on our electricity bill. So, what was the main reason you chose the most expensive one? Saving money or saving energy to reduce the effect on global warming? Oh, global warming certainly. The money savings were secondary. And did the salesman where you bought it mention global warming before you did that? Oh no, I think he thought we were a bit strange, but he was too polite to show it. But he did point out the lower electricity bills. And you, Joan, what do you think is the most serious environmental problem? Well, John and I both agree that it is global warming. What about the second most serious? Oh. It must be all those pesticides and other chemicals. Do you know that we are all walking around with hundreds of chemicals inside us that Mother Nature never intended to be there? John, what was that name they used? P O something. Persistent organic pollutants, dear. P O P's. That's it. P O P's. Well, they are so harmful. All that cancer. It's terrible. I agree. And what difference, if any, does this make to your shopping? Well, we love gardening, so we grow most of our own vegetables now. But when we buy food, we always go to the health food store and buy organic fruits and vegetables. And our children do the same now. It costs a bit more, 
But it's getting cheaper as more and more people insist on it. And the farmers are happy not to work with all those pesticides and herbicides. So we try to do our bit for the planet. That's great. Okay, let's drink our tea and coffee and then we'll carry on. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You're going to hear a university lecture about good study habits and developing a study plan. You now have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, everybody. As most of you know, I'm Professor Rosemary Parkinson, and as I'm sure you all know, else you wouldn't be here, I'm going to give a talk on good study habits and developing a study plan. First of all, why do I think such a talk will be helpful to to you? After all, you are all first-year university students. Although I see some familiar faces here. So I guess some of you have been at our university for much more than a week or so, but the point is, you've all been students for twelve years or more. So surely you know all about studying. Well, it seems rather strange, but all of us spend years at school learning maths, physics, chemistry, history, languages, all sorts of things. But how many of us have ever been to a class? Where they try to teach us how to learn, how to study in the most efficient and enjoyable way. I say enjoyable because learning things we don't enjoy learning that we think we have no interest in is such a bore. But in fact, many studies show that most of us enjoy studying most things if we do it right, if we study properly in an active way. That constantly uses our creativity, that makes us excited about what is coming next, that gives us the satisfaction of having solved a problem. How many of you know people who hate studying but love doing crosswords or playing computer games that challenge their minds and their reflexes? Lots of you, I'm sure. Well, one objective is to learn to enjoy studying in the same way we enjoy those crosswords and computer games. Okay, we'll come back to that later. Now, I want to discuss a few basics. One, regular exercise. Countless studies show that regular physical exercise, say forty minutes or so, five days a week of jogging. Fast walking, weight training, tennis, whatever you enjoy, puts you in a more positive frame of mind, and also increases creativity and memory for hours after the exercise. Other important things are to eat good, healthy food, get enough sleep, and try not to spend too much time and money in the student bar. There's nothing worse than trying to learn something or solve a problem than when you have a hangover. So, as the Romans used to say, "Mens sana in corpore sano," a healthy mind in a healthy body. Right now, we're all going to keep fit and healthy. What about st the studying? 
First, you must work out the times that you will use for study. When I say study, I mean all the schoolwork, writing essays, reading, etc., that you do out of class. Be realistic. Don't plan to spend 60 hours a week on it. It's too much for most of us. Set aside one or two blocks of time, each of, say, two or two and a half hours a day, that are your study time. As I say, be realistic. Don't set yourself such an ambitious goal that you will never stick to it. And it's also a good idea to leave one day a week, Sunday perhaps, completely free, so you can relax and occasionally do some schoolwork at those times when it builds up a bit. That's time settled. Now for place. We are creatures of habit. We do things better when we do them in places that we associate with a particular activity, in this case, studying. So it's best to try and set aside a quiet place, perhaps your bedroom, a study if you have one, which is where you study. When the weather is nice, it could be outdoors. Nothing is nicer than reading and thinking about that novel you have to read for English Literature 101 on a quiet, grassy bank by a stream on a sunny day. And we mustn't forget the library. Most of us find that studying, surrounded by the learning of centuries, is inspiring, as though studying is the only proper thing to do in a library. OK, time, place, what next? It is questions. Before you set out to read something, always ask yourself, what questions do I want and expect to be answered in this chapter or this paper? Don't simply start reading and hoping to absorb information like a sponge. Give the information somewhere to go, like little hooks in your brain to hang it on. These hooks are the questions you've thought of. And don't try to do too much at a time. After, say, 40 or 50 minutes, put the book down and tell yourself what you've learnt, what questions have been answered, what it means. Spend a few minutes on this and take a short walk while you're doing it. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer all your answers to the answer sheet. Listening Test 9 You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer the questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer all your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a university student radio station station broadcast. First, look at questions 1 to 5 on the form.
you will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first and repeated. And it's a bright sunny morning here at Portsmouth University Radio, the radio station that brings you all the news and lots of the fun non news from our wonderful campus and the city we live in. I'm your host, Mike, and with me is Rita. Hi, guys. So, Rita, what's on the menu this morning? Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have another chance to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. And it's a bright sunny morning here at Portsmouth University Radio, the radio station that brings you all the news and lots of the fun non news from our wonderful campus and the city we live in. I'm your host, Mike, and with me is Rita. Hi, guys. So, Rita, what's on the menu this morning? As usual, Mike, we'll start off with the most important, most exciting, and interesting news for all those thousands of our highly intellectual, very serious listeners sports. Right. Good news from the women's soccer team last night, I hear. Sure is. They thrashed Southampton by, would you believe it, not four, not five, but six goals to nil. Nothing. Zero. So the team's looking good for the Southern England University League that starts this Saturday. Did you see the game, Rita? I wanted to, but was stuck in the lab playing with rats. See the game? Against our closest rivals? Do you think I'd have missed it? Great game. So, who scored? No surprises here. Molly and Baker scored the first three, all in the first half. Susie Smith, last year's top scorer, hit the net five minutes into the second half, followed two minutes later by Joan Michael. Then Molly finished off the massacre just before the final whistle. Fantastic players. Great team. All our listeners know Susie Smith, of course, the blonde dynamite, and Joan Mitchell from last year. But Molly is new on campus, a first-year postgraduate medical student, all the way from Ghana, where she played for the national team, top scorer. An amazing 25 goals in international matches last season. African Woman Player of the Year. Look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen to more of the conversation between Mike and Rita and answer questions 7 to 10. Yeah, she's fantastic. She came very close to scoring more, but Southampton hemmed her in really tightly after they saw what she can do. I heard she could turn professional tomorrow if she wanted to, but prefers to enjoy the game as an amateur and study to become a doctor. That's true. OK, and how about the men's soccer team, Mike? Do I have to speak about this, Rita? A disaster. Played away at Bristol. I won't be surprised if some of them are too embarrassed to come back. Lost 6-2, and Bristol had their best two players watching from the sidelines because of injury. Let's change the subject. Good idea. No other sporting news today, but lots coming up this weekend. Now to the bad news from the students' union. Really bad news. Prices in the cafeteria and bar are going up by an average of 10% as from Monday. 75p for a cup of coffee. Four pounds for a pint of bitter. My favourite beer. So, complain. There's a demonstration planned for outside the students' union building at noon tomorrow. See you there, and you can phone us now 87597655 to tell us what you think. That is the end of section 1. You now have some time to check your answers.
Now turn to section two. Section two. You are going to hear an address given at the annual meeting of an international computer company by the company president. First, look at questions eleven to sixteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to sixteen. Good morning, fellow members of the board, staff members, and our dear stockholders. Welcome to our sixth annual general meeting. It is my pleasure to give you an overview of how the Orange Computer Company has done in the past year. When I have finished, we will be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Most of what I have to say is very encouraging, but to get it over with, I'll start with the bad news. Actually, it's not too bad. This time a year ago, we told you that we were about to launch our first mobile phone line, cell phone for our American friends. After a major promotion, our four mobile phones hit the market exactly one week later. Given our excellent company reputation. Very promising results from our market research, and what we thought were attractive, winning features at very competitive prices, our competitors were ready and waiting, with new models at prices that we had to match. So match them we did, but given the difficulty of breaking into this market, sales have been disappointing both in Europe and especially in North America. Given the massive growth of China's mobile phone production in recent years and our lack of experience in that part of the world, we did not market the phones in Asia. So our mobile phone subsidiary is still limping along, but sales are slowly growing. We believe the long battery life and reliability are beginning to have a larger impact on consumers. So we have planned a new promotion and marketing campaign stressing these two strengths. Our research also shows that after only a few weeks, most purchasers of the fanciest, most expensive mobile phones end up only using the basic functions: phone calls, messages, and chatting. So we will be appealing to the more conservative consumers, those who look for reliability rather than those who feel they need to always have the very latest and most complicated models. We are confident that we will soon build a strong position in this target market. Now look at questions seventeen to twenty. As the talk continues, answer questions seventeen to twenty. Now for the good news, as you can see in the annual report, total group income from sales increased to just over 1.83 billion euros, a very healthy 9.5 percent, and net profit after taxes increased to 126 million euros, or 18 percent. So you can look forward to a significant rise in share dividends. And an even bigger increase in the value of your stock holdings in Orange Computers. Let me briefly describe the main reasons for our even better than expected growth and profits this past year. One is the fruits of our merger four years ago with Ribbon Optical, Europe's largest camera and CCD maker. Our decision to get into the high-end digital and professional camera market has proven to be the right one. We have been particularly successful in the medical imaging field. Starting from nothing three years ago, our equipment is now being used by 12% of Europe's hospitals, and we have already, after just 18 months, made a promising entry into the North American market. In fact, just yesterday, we signed a 1.2 million dollar contract with one of America's best-known medical schools. Another major reason for a very profitable year 
was the increased outsourcing of our programming to India and China. This has resulted in very significant cost reductions on our software side. And I am happy to tell you that we managed to increase the proportion of the programming we outsource without laying off any of our European programming staff who we keep for those software and platform projects that we wish to keep most closely to ourselves. Efforts to increase energy efficiency have also reduced costs. We are also pleased that our decision, explained to you at our meeting a year ago, to stick to our core business and not to enter such areas as games, playstations, music, MP3, and the like, mobile phones were the one exception, is, in our opinion, proving correct. The competition is very fierce in these fields, with minimum returns, and, in the case of the music side, extremely costly in legal fees. That is the end of Section 2. You now have some time to check your answers. That's the end of side A. Tape 3. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You are going to hear a conversation between Mary and Mr. Hayes, one of her former high school teachers. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 25. Hi, Mr. Hayes. It's so great to see you again. Mary. One of my most favourite students. So, how are you? Well, to be honest, Mr. Hayes, not so good. That's why I wanted to see you. It's about university. So different from high school. Oh, dear. Well, why don't we sit down over there and you can tell me all about it? Let's see if I can be of any help to you. Oh, dear. I feel so stupid now. I shouldn't have bothered you. Don't be silly, Mary. We all need someone to speak to sometimes. And since your mother and father are in New Zealand, you probably feel a bit lost now and then. But before you say anything else, why don't you tell me the, all the things that you like about your new life at university? Gee, I don't know. I guess I like the city. Canterbury Cathedral is one of my favourite places. I often go there just to sit and think. Or just sit. Oh, I can quite understand that. And you've got the sea. I love the sea. And you are never more than a short cycle ride from the lovely Kent countryside. And how are your teachers? Oh, the profs are great. Not as good as you, but really interesting and always ready to explain things after class. But I don't know. They're really good. But I just can't seem to feel enthusiastic about studying anymore. Mary? Not a keen student any more? My dear, that's so hard to believe. You were always so energetic and interested in all your studies, except German, if I remember correctly. But you still did very well in it. And you always wanted to major in biology, which is what you're doing now. Do you still enjoy biology? As the conversation continues, answer questions 26 to 30. You now have some time to read questions 26 to 30. I don't know. I suppose so. But 
I kind of have to force myself to go to lectures and stuff. It all seems like, like a waste of time, pointless. Mary, I think I know you quite well. You are obviously not feeling yourself. Are you feeling sad or worried about something? Not really sad, and I don't think I'm worried about anything in particular. It's just that nothing seems worth bothering with. Have you spoken with your mum or dad lately? Not since Easter. I send them emails, but they hardly ever reply, and they are never in when I try to phone them. Always out filming. Yes, Mary. That is sometimes the problem with very successful parents. They get so wrapped up in their work that they neglect their kids. Not intentional, but it happens. I guess, but at least I could speak to them sometimes when they were here in London. But now, well, I feel really alone at Canterbury. Have you made any friends there, Mary? You were always such a popular person here. It seemed you were in every club and sports team, president of the chess club. Have you joined any university clubs? Not really. Suppose I should. I'll check out the debating society once I get back. That's a good idea. Let me know how you get on. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You are going to hear a lecture about the achievements of the ancient Aztecs of Central America. You now have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Good evening. Good to see so many people here to learn about the fascinating civilization of the Aztecs. By the way, is the microphone working? You can hear okay at the back. Good. Let's go back to 1519 A.D. Anyone know what happened in that year? Right. Hernan Cortez landed on that part of Central America that is today known as Mexico. He expected to find gold, and he did. What he did not expect to find, however, was the great Aztec civilization. Aztec legend said they originated in the plains of northwestern Mexico and slowly migrated southward. When they arrived at Lake Texcoco in 1325, they founded their great capital, Tenochtitlan. On the site of what is now Mexico City, the Aztecs developed a complex society and governmental structure, at the head of which was the emperor. They made many scientific advances, especially in the areas of astronomy and medicine. They also had a complicated religion, and interest in the arts, agriculture, and social conditions occupied much of their time. Let's talk about their remarkable achievements in some of these areas. You cannot do much if you don't have food to eat. So let's first take a look at their farming practices. The land that the Aztecs farmed was not fertile enough to grow enough food to support the growing population, so they were forced to invent methods to increase productivity, including irrigation, fertilizer, 
and even building terraces on hills to protect soil from running off, like we see today in China, the Philippines, and many other parts of the world. But one thing we don't see was their very original idea of chinapas, spelt C H I N A P A S. Chinapas were floating gardens built on swamps. Actually, they were quite simple to make. First, canals were dug through the marshes and swamps. Then, mud from the canals was placed on mats woven from weeds and straw. These mats were quite big, maybe five or six meters long and two across. Trees were then planted in the bed of the swamp at the corners of each mat. The trees took root. And the chinapas were held firmly in place. The Aztecs used these floating gardens to plant their main corn and also vegetables like beans, chili peppers, avocados, squash, and tomatoes. The Aztecs were very advanced in some ways, but they didn't use animals or plows to help them work the land. In fact, they didn't even have the wheel. No problem. The soil on the chinapas was soft enough that pointed sticks were all they needed to plant crops on them. But the Aztecs were much more than imaginative gardeners. They made great advances in the sciences, especially astronomy. I'm sure many of you have heard of the Aztecs' calendar stone. It took them fifty-two years, from fourteen twenty-seven. To 1479 to build the calendar stone, it was huge—a massive piece of rock, three feet thick, twelve feet in diameter, and weighing about twenty-four tons, on which they carved pictographs for the days and months of the Aztec calendar. This showed just how advanced the Aztecs were in the science of astronomy. It makes me think of the clean air they enjoyed in those days, when they could see all the stars shining so brightly in the night sky. They would have had a big problem doing this in most parts of the world nowadays. But back to the calendar stone. It had eighteen months, each of twenty days, namely three hundred sixty days made one year. But they had long before worked out. That there are three hundred sixty-five days in a year, so they added five days, which they called the nemantemi or sacrificial days, to get three hundred sixty-five. Remember, this was one hundred three years before the Gregorian calendar that we use today. Very sophisticated, those Aztec astronomers, and they were not only clever astronomers. The Aztecs made great advances in medicine. At the time, many Europeans looked down on the herbal medicine of the Aztecs as a heathen practice, just like they used to look down on traditional Chinese or African medicine. But in fact, Aztec doctors could do more than even the best doctors in Europe. Their medicine was primarily based on spiritual healing and herbal healing. Spiritual, because they believed many illnesses were caused by such things as an angry god, or bad birth signs. So their first step in treating an illness was always prayer, and sometimes animal sacrifice. But they also used herbal medicine, and concentrated much of their medical science on finding out what herbs could do. Just like the ancient Chinese doctors, so over generations the Aztecs accumulated a vast knowledge of the herbs in the world around them and the medicinal properties of each one. One difference with traditional Chinese medicine is that the Aztecs concentrated more on curing the symptoms of a disease than getting at the cause of the disease. They felt that if a god or goddess wished to make them ill, then they could do nothing about the root cause, namely a god. If the medicine worked, it meant that the gods approved of the patient getting well again.
That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have ten minutes to transfer all your answers to the answer sheet. Listening test ten. You'll hear a number of different recordings, and you'll have to answer the questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the question booklet. At the end of the test, you'll be given ten minutes to transfer all your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. Listen to Jane and her friend Sally discussing Jane's preparations to go on a tour abroad. Abroad. Look at the questions one to five on the form now. You'll see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first and then repeated. Who is it? It's me, Sally. The door's open. Hi. Hi. So, have you decided where to go for your big holiday? Finally, I narrowed it down to Southeast Asia, or India and Pakistan, and decided on the Southeast Asia. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have another chance to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Who is it? It's me, Sally. The door's open. Hi. Hi. So, have you decided where to go for your big holiday? Finally, I narrowed it down to Southeast Asia, or India and Pakistan. And decided on the Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia. Wow, sounds romantic. Decided when you'll leave? I have to be back in time for the new term, so I want to leave by July first. That's a long trip. Three months nearly. Don't you think it's too long? No, I want to do research on recycling while I'm there for my environmental studies course next year. So I've got tons of things to do. I don't know where to start. First things first: passport, air ticket, and money. How much money are you taking? I hear it's not cheap like it used to be. The passport's okay for another two years. I'll go to the travel agent tomorrow, and I reckon three thousand pounds should be plenty. I'm glad I kept doing that horrible waitress job this past three years. A thousand a month sounds plenty, including airfare. No, Dad's got a frequent flyer award, so I should be able to get to Singapore and back for nothing. Yeah, but you have to be careful. Normally, those free ticket things mean you can only fly when there are empty seats. Don't want you to get stuck there until all the rich Asian students have flown back here after seeing their families. Look at question six to ten. Now listen to more of the conversation between John and Sally, and answer questions six to ten. I'll manage, but I'll see what the travel agent has to say. Gosh, July first. 
That's only a bit over three weeks. Inoculations, all sorts of nasty diseases in those tropical places. Have you checked out the health requirements? Didn't think of it. How do I start? I think there's a Ministry of Health webpage that tells you what injections and pills you need before you go to different countries. Yellow fever, malaria, that sort of stuff. How many countries do you plan on visiting? As many as I can. Singapore, Malaysia. I'd like to get to Sabah and Sarawak in East Malaysia if I can. Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and Indonesia for sure. That's pretty ambitious. How do you plan to get around? As cheap as I can. Don't fancy flying much. Maybe I can get a boat from Singapore to Borneo. You didn't mention Borneo. Well, that's the big island where Sabah and Sarawak are. Most of it belongs to Indonesia. Oh, I know. And Brunei, right? That little place with tons of oil. Right. Have you still got your camera? Yeah, and Dave has promised me a digital video camera for my birthday. But your birthday isn't until late July. An early birthday present. That's what brothers are for. That is the end of section one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two, you are going to hear a talk given to students on going to study in England. First, look at questions eleven to sixteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to sixteen. Good morning, everybody. I'm Richard Smethers from International Students Consulting, and welcome to today's talk on what you need to know and think about prior to going to study in the UK. Probably the biggest question is that of housing. It can be very expensive, especially in London. And the halls of residence in most universities are certainly not cheap. That's what you pay for convenience. Probably the best thing for most of you, I believe it's the first time any of you have studied in the UK, is to try to find a vacancy in a coop house with other students. If you are keen to make maximum progress with your English, I would suggest that you try to find accommodation with at least one native speaker. So many foreign students end up living only with people from their own country, and I've actually known cases where their English is worse after three years than when they arrived. One advantage of living with British students is that they'll probably have experience of dealing with landlords, looking after the bills, and other things that might be done quite differently in your home country. So, how to find shared housing? Any housing? Arrive early. It's best to try and be in the town or city where you'll be studying at least a week before the start of term. If you leave it too late, you'll be competing with thousands of other students, all looking for a place to live. And one of your first stops should be the housing office. They have a database of all types of off-campus accommodation, and the early bird catches the worm, as they say. You'll probably meet other students at there in the same boat you are, and chat with people. If you meet any that seem to be the type of people you could get along with, then you might well sort out your accommodation quite quickly with them. Now look at question seventeen to twenty.
As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. Now, I know that a few of you will be going with your sponsors. Sharing a house or a flat with other students is probably not what most of you would prefer. If you are trying to save money, a studio flat, which has a bedroom and living room combined, and a place to cook, is usually cheaper than a flat with a separate bedroom and a kitchen. But remember, you will probably need somewhere to study at home. Once you have found a place to live, there are a few things you should check out very carefully with the landlord or the estate agent. Quite a few estate agents look after the renting out of housing for one or several landlords. First, how are you going to pay the rent? By the way, I forgot to mention that you should open a bank account very soon after you arrive. You might want to open a savings account for the bulk of your money and keep some in a current account for paying the bills. The advantage of the former is that you get more interest on your deposit, but you usually can't write checks or arrange to pay such things as electricity, gas, telephone, and water bills, plus what you owe the landlord. These are normally paid on a monthly or quarterly basis with what are called direct debits and standing orders. The rent, of course, is usually paid monthly, and most landlords want a deposit of one or two months' rent to pay for any damage you might do. Accidents happen, and it's sad but true that there are thieves everywhere. Make sure you have good locks on your doors and windows, and insist that the landlord or estate agent changes them if they are not up to scratch. You should take out insurance for major items such as personal computers. If you have a car, then insurance is required by law. And if you think you may want to get a car, make sure you take your current driving license with you because it may help you get cheaper car insurance. But the most important type of insurance you should take out is medical insurance. Falling off your bike and breaking your arm can be a very costly business if you are not protected by insurance. Unlike the Student Union Advisory Service in your university, I am not allowed to offer you the best advice on what insurance company to use. Now what about working? If you have a student visa for longer than six months, you can work for up to 20 hours per week during term time or 40 hours per week otherwise without applying for permission from the home office. And if you have a UK visa based on a relationship to someone with a long-term visa in the UK, you will normally be free to take up any sort of employment in the UK. That is the end of section 2. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You're going to hear two hosts of a TV programme talking about taking notes from lectures. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 25. Hello everybody, and welcome once again to How to Study program on the Oxford TV Educational Channel. As usual, we are your hosts, Rick and... Rita. Okay, Rick, what's today's topic? Note-taking. Right, note-taking. It's one of those things most of us students do, but has anyone ever told you how to do it so it can be the greatest help to you? If you had teachers like mine all of your life, 
Probably not. Same here. Rita and I thought of this topic a few weeks ago, did some research, and found that most students don't take or use notes in the best way. Of course, different things work better for different people, but we did manage to come up with some useful basic principles. But first, how do we know it helps? How do we know it isn't better to listen carefully to everything the lecturer says, rather than scribble away taking notes? Well, we found that research on note-taking has been going on since this guy, Professor C. C. Crawford, began his studies in the 1920s. But we don't have time to tell you all about the different studies that have been done. The important thing is that most researchers agree that taking notes is better than not taking notes and that reviewing notes is the key to their usefulness. Both are really important. For example, in 1970, a Professor Howe concluded that students were seven times more likely to recall information one week after it was presented if the information had been recorded in their notes. He argued that the note-writing activity per se makes a contribution to later retention. But another important thing is that you shouldn't take notes like a human tape recorder. Listen to this, and I quote, There is growing evidence that note-taking combined with critical thinking facilitates retention and applications of the information. As the conversation continues, please answer questions 26 to 30. You now have some time to read questions 26 to 30. In fact, in 1979, two researchers found that students who took notes verbatim scored lower on comprehension tests than those who processed information at a high level, which is inhibited by taking notes this way. Similarly, in 1985, another researcher found that the most successful students thought about the relationships between the facts the lecturer told them and the better organization of their notes reflected this process. And putting information in different geometric figures, squares, triangles, rings, etc., like in computer programming, to stand for different functions and alternatives, improves this reorganization. Okay, now for some practical basics. You start, Rick. 1. Be prepared. Have your notebook open and pen in hand when class begins. 2. Listen for what the teacher emphasizes with words like to summarize. The main point is, and if something is written on the board, you should probably write it down. And if something is repeated, it's probably important. Don't try to write down every word, just the main ideas, content, and information. And develop your own way of abbreviating words. Go over your notes as soon as possible after class. Underline or highlight main ideas, concepts, and information. And last thing, reorganizing notes while reviewing leads to higher test scores. That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You're going to hear a talk given to some parents of children with disabilities about a type of therapy. You now have some time to read questions 31 to 40.
Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our hospital's recreational therapy department. I'm Dr. Gillian Roberts, and I'm the department head. You all have children who have some form of disability, and your family physicians have recommended that they come here for treatment. Many people don't know very much about recreational therapy. It sounds rather like playing to get better. Well, in a way, it is, but it's much more than this. So today I'll give you an overview of the basic principles and some common activities of this form of therapy. Please don't hesitate to interrupt me if you have any questions. Let me start by painting a picture in your minds. Imagine a young child with a disability and an adult splashing around, playing and laughing in a swimming pool. For the child, this happy scene is very different from the daily struggle of, for example, learning to walk without crutches. The adult is a recreational therapist. It's fun, but it's also work and successful work as she sees the improvement in the child's balance, leg motion range, and lower body strength. Equally important, she sees that the child is slowly but surely gaining confidence. So this probably gives you an idea of what recreational therapy is all about. How about a definition? The American Therapeutic Recreation Association describes it as a healthcare and human service discipline that delivers treatment services designed to restore, remediate, and/or rehabilitate functional capabilities for persons with injuries, chronic illnesses, and all types of disabling conditions. Well, that's quite a mouthful, but you can see that it covers a wide range of conditions and patients. At this hospital. We used to specialize in children under twelve, while older people went to St James, very close to here. But we found that children can be encouraged by seeing adults doing similar things to what they're doing, and they also get very attached to their therapists. So now both hospitals treat both youngsters and adults, and we work very closely together, especially on research projects. Okay, who are the therapists? Well, most of them are certified therapeutic recreation specialists, usually simply called recreational therapists. They're certified through the National Council for Therapeutic Recreation Certification, which requires a bachelor's degree or higher, a formal internship, and passing a certification examination. To maintain their certification, they must also participate regularly in professional education activities. Recreational therapists work in a wide range of clinical service areas, but they play an especially important role in the rehabilitation of children with disabling conditions. Their work with children includes such activities as physical play, focused on restoration or maintenance of functioning, and the one-on-one -on -one bedside play with a single child or small group activity. By the way, it seems that so far I've been talking about physical problems. In fact, our work also includes trying to help with psychological problems. For example, educational play focused on understanding upcoming surgery, dramatic or expressive play focused upon coping with fear and anxiety, and family or sibling play to help overcome such things as excessive shyness, hostility, and other emotional problems. What makes recreational therapy different from other forms of therapy? As the name suggests, it's the use of recreational activities as the mode of treatment. The treatment goals that a recreational therapist may work towards are similar to the goals of other disciplines on the rehabilitation team, but the way of achieving those goals is different. Also, the recreational therapist has a holistic perspective that includes the patient's leisure, social, cognitive, and physical needs. This means that a recreational therapist may work with a child on one or more of the following functional areas: physical functioning, things like mobility, strength, and motor skills; cognitive functioning, such as attention span, memory, and problem solving; emotional functioning, things like self-esteem, confidence, and coping skills; social functioning, how to communicate and interact with others. Sadly, sometimes we also have to help patients learn to manage pain. Other areas include developmental play skills, leisure interests, and abilities. Well, that sounds more like something to do with recreation than the other things I just mentioned. 
As you can imagine, with all those different things that might need to be worked on, a recreational therapist may use a wide range of techniques to meet the needs of each child. After completing a comprehensive assessment, the recreational therapist identifies appropriate treatment goals and decides on the methods to be used. These methods might include leisure skill building, adaptive sports, aquatic therapy. I mentioned splashing around in a pool at the beginning of my talk, therapeutic art, and animal assisted therapy. This is increasingly popular. It's wonderful how a friendly dog can do more than all the doctors in the world for some disabled kids. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have ten minutes to transfer all your answers to the answer sheet.